Zoom platform is allowed by section 21.8 of the Iowa Code and point of clarification. Zoom platform is not in the Iowa Code, but we can hold it electronically. Anyone who desires to provide input on any item may do so as a video participant by going to zoom.us backslash j black slash 8265930280. Or you may call in by dialing 1-312-626-6799. And the Zoom meeting ID number is 826-593-023. Or optionally, you can go to the cityofames.org website and under government and mayor and city council, and then going to city council meetings on that page, you can click on the agenda for the date of tonight's meeting. Utilize the hot link on the top of the agenda to access this meeting via Zoom. If you do join us on Zoom during the meeting, all participants will be placed on mute. If a participant wishes to speak regarding an item, they should use the raise hand feature found on the menu or you can use by phone by pressing star nine to raise your hand. Participants will be unmuted one at a time to provide their comments. And if on Zoom, their name will be called or if they're on the phone, the last three digits of their phone number will be announced to indicate that it's your turn to speak. Please state your name and address for the record before beginning your comments. We should be limited to no more than three minutes. And once your statement has concluded, the moderator will mute your microphone once again. The meeting can also be viewed live in the following ways on our YouTube channel. That would be www.youtube.com backslash Ames channel 12. Or go to our website, www.cityofames.org backslash channel 12 or on Mediacom channel 12. Tonight, council, we are working from an amended agenda and there are two items to bring, draw your attention to on that agenda. 
The first is item 32 has been pulled at the request of the applicant and under administration we've added item before 35 which is request from farmers market so proceeding on we're going to go ahead and go to items number one and two which are two proclamations that i will read the first being historic preservation month Whereas historic preservation is an effective tool for managing growth and sustaining development, revitalizing neighborhoods, fostering local pride, and maintaining community character while enhancing livability. And whereas historic preservation is relevant for communities across the nation, both urban and rural, and for Americans of all ages, all walks of life, and all ethnic backgrounds, and whereas historic preservation is inherently economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable, fostering a culture of reuse and maximizing the life cycle of all resources through conservation, and where it is important to celebrate the role of history in our lives and the contributions made by dedicated individuals in helping to preserve the tangible aspects of the heritage that has shaped the Ames community and us as a people and whereas our, it is our mission to enrich lives by saving our past, now more than ever, we look to our history for courage, comfort, and inspiration. Therefore, I, John A. Ayla, Mayor of the City of Ames, Iowa, do hereby recognize May 2020 as National Historic Preservation Month and proclaim the month of May 2020 as Ames Historic Preservation Month and call upon the people of Ames to join their fellow citizens across the United States in recognizing this special observance. And secondly, we have a proclamation on Fair Housing Month. Whereas April is, a fair, is Fair Housing Month, a time when we celebrate the Fair Housing Act and recommit ourselves to ensuring every American has access to housing that is free from discrimination the Fair Housing Act makes it unlawful to discriminate in housing transactions based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, or family status. This year, HUD is especially focused on protecting the rights of individuals to feel safe and secure in their homes, free from sexual harassment or unwanted sexual advances. And whereas the city of Ames additionally prohibits discrimination in the areas of housing, education, unemployment, public accommodations or services, credit, sexual orientation, developmental disability, physical disability, gender and gender identity. And whereas equality of opportunity for all is a fundamental policy of this nation, state, county and our city. And that fair housing is a positive community good and whereas only with the cooperation, commitment, and support from HUD, the city, Ames Human Relations Commission, housing providers, and all the residents of Ames and Story County can barriers to the enjoyment of this and other aspects of equality of opportunity for all be removed. Therefore, I, John A. Hala, Mayor of the City of Ames, Iowa, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2020 as Fair Housing Month and establish Ames and Story County as inclusive community committed to fair housing and encourage all citizens in our communities to support and endorse fair housing, reaffirm their commitment to fair housing for all, and wholeheartedly recognize these rights and responsibilities throughout the year. Moving on to item number three, we have a presentation of a Home for Everyone Awards by the Ames Human Relations Commission. I believe, Deb, are you uh, going to uh, take that on for us? Um, I'll turn it over to Jill Crosser. She is the chair of the Human Relations Commission. Hi, Jill, thank you. Hello, can you guys see me? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Well, my name is Jill Crosser and I'm with the Ames uh, Human Relations Commission. Um, and as you said, each year during the month of April, the commission recognizes and honors an individual or organization that's made um, a commitment to providing safe, quality, and equitable housing opportunities that enhance the quality of life of members of disadvantaged populations. We call this the Home for Everyone Award. 
and I have a picture of them here. I don't know where the actual ones are, but we will we will work on getting them to the recipients. Um, I'm honored to announce that the first award will be presented to the Access Housing Team. They work to advocate for crime victims experiencing housing instability and homelessness to secure housing. They also offer a housing first approach to their work, which means housing is the first step to recovery. We all know that having a safe home can be a kickstart for people who have experienced adversity and restabilization. Thank you for all the work you do for our community, for thinking creatively in challenging situations, and for helping to navigate the cities of Story County. And the second award is for Cassandra or Cassie Kramer, who leads the Access Housing Team. Um, it's been proven that her leadership has been instrumental in the work that the team does day in and day out. Um, her advocacy goes beyond a normal eight to five shift and she makes herself available to help those that need assistance. Among juggling multiple complex issues, she remains calm and is people centered. Her compassion has significantly impacted the survivors she serves in the Ames community. So thank you, uh, Access Housing and Cassie Kramer. Thank you very much. We all clap, I guess, or we can all do a little uh, clap sign. I don't know if they're on, but. <laughs> Jill, this is Cassandra Kramer. Um, oh, we are on the line. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for um, giving us this award. We really appreciate uh, being nominated and also receiving it. We really enjoy working in the community and being able to help those who are struggling with housing, especially during these uh, difficult times. Um, and so we'll use this uh, to kind of increase our platform and to continue doing the work that we do in the area. Wonderful. Thank you. Access. Thank you. Thank you for all the work you do. Absolutely. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you for coming on and joining us. And we will make sure that you get these awards physically. Sounds good. Thank you. Anything else, Jill? No, that's all I have tonight. Thanks. All right. Thank you for your service. Appreciate it very much. Yes, of course. Mayor, right. this is this is Deb, and I wanted um, everyone to be aware that we also have Wayne Clinton, who's um, also a member of um, the Ames Human Relations Commission. He is on the on the meeting tonight, and he is our co-chair um, for the commission. So he was able to join us as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Jill. Appreciate Thank it. Very much. All right. Okay. We're going to move on to consent agenda and council. I'd like to draw your attention to item 16 B, which is um, the airport improvements program it was caught this afternoon by one of our council members and we verified it with Damien. The agenda indicates that the setting the DBE which is disadvantaged business enterprise goal was listed on the agenda as 0.3%. It's also listed that way on the council action form, but in actuality, in the actual notice and agreement and uh, the signed document that's included in your packet also, uh, by, and signed by Damien, it's actually 0.6%, not 0.3%. So the minutes should, should show that on the basis you approve this resolution, it's, it's the, the DBE goal is 0.6%. With that, does council want to pull any other items from the agenda? Any, pull any items from the agenda? Mayor, I'd like to pull item 10. All right, Gloria, item 10. And also item 24, please. Item 24. Any other items that it wish you pulled? Hearing none, entertain a motion of approving consent, less items number 10, 24, and recognizing item 16B being amended as I as mentioned. So moved. Second. Betcher and Martin, thank you. Roll call, please. Betcher. Aye. Martin. Aye. Junk. Aye. Corrieri. Aye. Martin. Aye. Lee Hansen. Aye. Okay, uh, item 10, Gloria. Item 10 is the request from Ames Velo for their annual event 
the Ames Velo Grand Prix. And I think all of us realize that planning for this event is going to be challenging this year because of the pandemic situation. We don't know what the, the timing is actually going to be. And I guess my main concern about this particular event is that in these uncertain times, they are hoping to add a beer garden and vending to the event. And while it might be um, easy to try and, and arrange a sporting event with some more social distancing, I really can't imagine a beer garden that is socially distanced effectively. And so I would like us to look at this event minus the beer garden and vending and allow them to come back to um, apply for that at a later date when we're more certain of what the health circumstances are. So the request is for um, Saturday, June 13th and Sunday, June 14th with alternative backup dates of August 22nd and August 23rd. So is your, is your recommendation for both of those dates, the backup uh, date and the other and the original date and the backup date? Mayor, I would feel more comfortable if we didn't add that particular aspect of the event this year. But, um, you know, if it were possible for them to find the, the timing to request it again before their event, I would be willing to consider it for either the June date or the August date. I just don't think it's going to be very likely we're seeing this kind of sporting event in June. Yeah, I actually have a concern about the June date myself, especially with the two largest bike rides in Iowa being canceled, um, which are scheduled, were scheduled to be later than June. Um, I I could be in support of them coming back and, and you know, us looking at the August date, but um, I'm not in favor of, of the June date at this point. Okay. Well, we have two, we have two uh, topics on here. One we have, or items, one is, the date of June 13th, 14th, and the other one is the beer garden. Mayor, David, we do have two. David, or were you going to say something, David? Um, yeah, I was going to ask Gloria, I guess, um, that the, the council forum pointed out that further council action would be required for the liquor license aspect in any case. Um, but you're suggesting that that, that um, knowing that that would come back to us still isn't enough you would still prefer to um, add another step of application for them because of the vending well yeah i think that the the vending and the beer garden are both problematic from my perspective and honestly you know i would be more comfortable if we weren't looking at the june date um, but i guess with the uh, contingency planning already worked into this I, I wouldn't have difficulty approving the event. I don't know, Brian, do you know whether this was approved with a vending license last year? Yes, I, I believe that uh, vending was a component in the previous year. I, would I could double check that to be certain. Um, I do note um, that uh, two organizers of the event um, are on the meeting and would like to speak and perhaps they could outline uh, what has what has taken place and what their plans are as well, if that might clarify things. Uh, yeah, I would love to hear. Uh, are they available to speak then, Ryan? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, Jason Quinn, uh, I think has his hand raised first. I'll unmute him. Hi everybody, it's Jason. Hey, uh, Name and address, please, and then you go ahead. Yeah, Jason Quinn, 1412 Burnett. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll go first, then Scott will talk second. If you guys remember, I'm the uh, race promoter and Scott's the director. I think one thing to point out, and maybe Scott can confirm this, is that downtown Ames is actually hosting the beer garden as a separate event in uh, concert with what we're doing. So that's a separate deal. And maybe the paperwork needs to be resubmitted to clarify that. They came to us and asked us whether they could host that event. 
sort of inside of our event. We thought it would, at the time, none of this was going on. We thought it would be a great uh, community kind of opportunity. Um, so that's one one topic, and maybe Scott can elaborate on that a little bit more. It might be worth bringing downtown Ames into the fold on that. Certainly, we agree that at this point, we've already had one of our races canceled by um, USA Cycling. So there's you guys having to approve it along with US, USA Cycling do it. A lot of the races are being canceled. I think maybe to compare like what RAGBRA is against versus us is they have so much coordination that has to happen amongst all these different counties. We've looked at what they're doing and that's sort of what differentiates maybe a race um, from what we're doing. And one of the reasons we brought out that August date is because we absolutely expected that even if you guys approved it, that maybe USA Cycling won't even let us have it. So um, I think that we are completely in agreement that you know, uh, with all the distancing restrictions going on, that a beer garden really doesn't make much sense. We had the vending open last year, but I think maybe, um, you know, obviously we'll, we'll work with everybody to do whatever we can and things to, things change day by day. Um, but we definitely want to get the August date on there so that we can make sure we can kind of keep this as an annual activity. And if it just doesn't fit in, that that's fine. Um, but I guess that's all that I have. If you guys have any questions for me, I'd be glad to ask, answer those too. Questions for Jason? Yeah. So Jason, um, you're saying that uh, if we wouldn't be comfortable with the June date, you would be okay with us approving only the August date? Or do you want us to approve both of them in on the off chance that uh, USA Cycling is gonna say, yes, we will have events in June? Um, I I would say that we all need to work together. I think I'd like to know that if suddenly things lift and we could, you know, get this race into the, the middle of the summer when it's really convenient for a lot of people, um, that would be awesome. Um, and that's why we have the backup date on there. We definitely would, um, like I said, I don't think it's a prerequisite to have a beer garden at all with part of our event. I want to make that super clear. And, um, Maybe there's sort of a rolling definition of what we can do at the race to make it acceptable. We certainly work within those guidelines. Um, and to say like, hey, at some particular point, if maybe there's some verbiage that goes along that says, hey, this is at some point you get you guys can pull the plug and say, hey, we approved June, but the way that things are going right now, that needs to move on to August. And if an August time becomes unavailable, then we just say, forget it, we'll move to 2021. So I don't know how that all gets put into an agreement, but um, you know, I I would say that I could commit that for the team that we would always be working within the guidelines of how comfortable the city felt about doing things. I really appreciate that. I think you've done a great job in previous years to work with us on this event. Yeah, and you know, we're all we all work in this community too. So one thing we don't want to do is you know, put anybody's safety at risk. It's one of our you know, main criteria is working with our, our fellow city members. So, um, yeah. So maybe we should, if there's any questions for me, we'll let maybe Scott come on and talk a little bit too. You know, I would just make a comment, Jason, that is the, uh, one of the alternatives that's included in the council action form is alternative one stipulates that the approval is contingent on the city council removing the prohibition of public gatherings and city right of ways due to COVID-19 emergency for the event dates requested by the Ames Grand Prix. So to your point, we want to be very explicit in terms of you understand that you know, the approval is granted by council. It may be with the understanding that right now, until they remove that prohibition, um, the 13th and 14th would not um, still be available or council is going to have to change the way it is worded granting permission with the right of uh, retracting that within a certain time period so you're aware of you know having to reschedule it so we'll make, right. make, make sure we're all, all on the same page so yeah absolutely i think what we'd like to be able to do is go ahead and sort of announce to our audience like hey right now we have, you know, we've been approved, but that's tentative and that may be moved to a further date or maybe canceled. So at least just there's a way to communicate to folks that might be coming from out of town that at any moment it could be, you know, scratched off the list. Um, 
Jason, how much advanced, how much advanced uh, notice is, is two weeks? I mean, it looks like from the council action forum, you may be notified by the uh, within two weeks before the event that your insurance may not be uh, granted either. Is that correct? Um, I'll have to have Scott Wall answer that. I feel like okay. based on our agreement with USA Cycling, that if there's anything that's outside of our control, that we can meet. I think he'll, as a director, he'll build it to speak to this, but I believe at any point, if we need to like stop the race anytime before the race, that we can just refund people their money if they've already pre-registered. So I think we'll all be safe at that point then. I think that I speak for council too, is I think that we greatly appreciate the fact that you brought this race to our community. It's, there's nothing more than I think we want to do is to have this race going on. <laughs> Um, to really um, promote, you know, our wonderful downtown and our community. So I, I'm sure you're aware that hesitations are not because you don't care about the race. It's just more or less having to navigate uncharted territory for us. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're all learning, you know, minute to minute on this stuff. So absolutely. we definitely you. appreciate you guys working with us. Thank you, Jason. Any other questions for Jason? Otherwise, we'll go ahead and let Scott speak. I have one follow-up question, um, sure, and it wasn't it wasn't clear to me in your answer that you're. Do you have a strong preference for one of the two dates? Do you really want council to address the question of June? Because right now it sounds like we, you know we might really be talking about August instead. You know, um, it's hard. My my personal opinion, as someone who needs to get out and promote it, and kind of looking at the way things are going across our state, I would like to reserve a spot for June with the option to go to August. But I have to defer that to you guys because I feel you're most qualified to do it. We'd be willing to accept either one, obviously. Um, so, okay, thanks. Sorry if that's a wishy-washy answer, but we're kind of you know working together on this, and I'm not sure what what's too much to ask. I got it. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Scott. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, Jason, I think Jason covered it pretty well, but with respect to... I'm sorry, I'm sorry Scott. Plans, Scott, would you introduce uh, your, your name and oh, your no, answer, sorry, please? No, no. Yeah, Scott Wall, 1306 Douglas Avenue in Ames. Thank you. And I'm the race, the race director, which just means I fill out all the paperwork for PSA Cycling. Jason talks to the sponsors. Um, to, to repeat what I said, Jason did a good job of covering, I think, most of the issues. With respect to USA Cycling, uh, they have currently suspended all racing until May 31st. So there are, there are several races that have been canceled. I expect that that, that suspension took place in, um, I believe, about April 9th or thereabouts. I think if, if they decide to extend that suspension into June, we'll probably know that by May 10th thereabouts. So with respect to USA Cycling, as far as race being canceled from them, we'll probably know before the middle of June whether or not they will permit our race going forward. As Jason said, the city council may take issue with that. USA Cycling may say it's okay to hold races again. The city council may say it's not, in which case I have no problem with going to the August dates. I'm with Jason that I'd like to have those June dates as part of the approval. From what I've read, the approval process is if you approve the June dates, city council says, no, we're not doing it in June, then we just automatically roll over to August 22nd, 23rd. But I like to have the option open for the June dates. If, if things don't open, if the state is talking about opening up again, it could happen. I'm probably, I don't think I'm personally optimistic that it will, but it's nice to have the options. Any questions for Scott? Thank you, Jason and Scott, for joining us. All right, Council. Well, so I guess my question would be, if if it's the case that um, the beer garden is a separate issue that is an event the downtown was interested in hosting within the Velo, um, then I guess we put that issue aside in this motion. And it's just the question of the vending license for the event. Um, Brian, is that, um, I don't know how the vending license figures into this. I know we've got separate items. 
uh, within item 10 that relate to vending? Gloria, I will point out that we, we did approve vending last year, just to answer that question. Oh, I no, I know we okay. I know we approved it last year, but I am saying I'm not sure okay. that I want to approve it this year. And so is it as simple as removing um, items 10A2 and 10A3 and B2 and B3 from the motion? Yes, if, if you did not want to approve vending as a part of the, the approvals for the event, then you would do exactly that. Just for point of clarification, is is the vending for selling souvenirs or for selling other things other than alcohol? I believe Scott uh, would like to speak again. I wonder if he might be able to answer that. The vending I think it's important because I mean I think we get confused in terms of is it is it the alcohol or is it vending other things? So Scott, just so we make sure we're on the same page, if you want to go ahead and uh, you don't need to introduce yourself again, just go ahead and answer that question or comment. Our perspective. I mean from our perspective, the vending is for food. Um, last year, we did not have, we did not invite any vendors to the Saturday race. We invited a food vendor, Rico Tacos, to the Sunday race at the research park. Uh, my feeling is we don't want to compete with downtown Ames businesses, restaurants that serve food. There are several businesses in the area. At the research park, there's not a good availability of food where we're racing, which is out by the uh, Ames by the uh, IFC core building and Ames Fitness. So we brought in a food truck there on the Sunday event so that the racers had a, a food item available or they could, they could just go and they didn't have to drive two miles away from the site to find something to eat. So our vending, we'd like to have the option of having vending on Saturday, but I don't expect that we'll invite any food trucks or such to that. Our vending request has nothing to do with the alcohol, it's just for food and it's mostly just for Sunday. Questions for Scott on this one? So Scott, last year it was only at the research park that you had the food, not downtown, correct? Right. Yeah. So I guess I'd be ready to make a motion. So just quick, quick, quick. So Scott, if council would decide to not approve a blanket vending license, for the Main Street race, but would approve a blanket vending license for the research park, which is on Sunday, would that comply with what you're trying to accomplish? That would work for us. <clears throat> Thank you. That makes sense, Gloria? Yes, and, and I think given what Scott said about not wanting to compete with the downtown businesses, I think they've had enough of a hard ride this season, and so, I would move that we approve uh, the Ames Velo Grand Prix uh, items 10A, 1, 4, 5, and 6, and 10B, 1 through 5. Is there a second? I'll second. Martin seconded. Thank you. Any further discussion? My, my only hesitation is I want to be a little careful about going through um, these items. Um, I'd rather have a consistent policy. Um, we're, we're going to have other types of requests and um, lots of unknowns before uh, June. And so um, I'm, I'm going to go along with this, but it just seems like we've, we've, might, we've tailored this quite a bit with a lot of unknowns. Um, we have lots of events with food vendors um, on Main Street on Saturdays, and that's never been an issue before. Um, but I appreciate your comment, Tim. I think just, bit, just to editorialize for a second, I think the point was what we heard from Scott was that there actually was no intent on this time to actually offer food because of a uh, what's going on in downtown. So I think it's really kind of following along with what they were actually approving. So I appreciate what you're saying. Okay. I tended to ag agree with Amber's first statement about 
wanting to aim for August. So I don't know. I mean, I guess it's okay as, but just the likelihood that this is going to occur in June is very, very low. So I don't know why we're not just saying yeah, August I just, now. So I guess I would be supportive of, of saying August because I think that's where we're going to end up anyway. Amber? Yeah, I, I feel like it's really too, I mean, to Tim's point, there are a lot of unknowns still. And I'm just not sure we're in a point to be approving special events um, until we have more information on, on what this looks like going forward. I guess my assumption was that we built into the, the options are able to, to pull this event. If city council is not comfortable with the health situation in June. Yeah, I, I get that. I just hesitate promoting. Oh, breaking up. And what that other organizations who are sorry amber you're gonna to have to go ahead and restate what you just said because you kind of broke up you lost your connection i think you could try turning off your video and see if that helps yeah no my my point was that i hate to have events being promoted and send the message to other organizations uh, that we're encouraging these types of things um even if you know, we start to see things open up. I don't think that necessarily means we need to facilitate special events and encouraging people to travel into our community and, and across state lines. Yeah, so, I, I think I, I would echo kind of as well as 500 people potentially coming to the race and people from a lot of other communities as well. We do want to bring those people into Ames, but when it's safe, and I think that shooting for an August date would be a lot safer and um, kind of more fair to make them not cancel it at the last minute if we don't know what's going to happen in June. Would someone like to propose a friendly oh, amendment? Brian, you want to say something first? I was just going to say I, I would. So all uh, I would uh, do everything Gloria did with a friendly. I would move a friendly amendment that we approve this for the August date, but not the June date. I would accept that amendment. Okay. Uh, Mayor, I just want to make sure that motion includes the contingency that even on the August date, that's subject you're removing the prohibition. So yeah. make sure that contingency mm -hmm. there. Okay. So you want to add that, Gloria, or you want to amend your motion or something? Oh, I I assumed it was part of it because. Okay. Um, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't clearly part of it, but I, I, we need the clarification and we need another second for the amendment. I'll second the amendment. Oh, uh, thank you, David. Amendment is seconded by uh, Junk. Another friendly amendment on the uh, clarification that the uh, council reserves a right to. Uh, uh, I would, withdraw. I would add that as part of my friendly amendment, and then Rachel, if you'd second that too. Yeah, second. <laughs> okay, very good. Everyone understand the, the uh, motion as so mo Just state the amendments for me again, please. The amendment was. Gloria's motion with the date of August, the August 22nd, is that what it was, right? August 22nd and 23rd and not June. And that, um, of course, in August, that's subject to the prohibition of, of um, gatherings on public land being dismissed at that point. Right. Everyone understand the motion? As amended, David. Yes, yes, yes. I understand it. I think okay. it's a little weird um, with the friendly amendments, but I understand what we're doing, and that's fine. Well, Are we just going to vote on that amendment? That, that's that's why I'm a little confused. Well, that's where I was going next. I was going to vote okay. on the amendment. So. I, okay. I thought friendly amendments didn't require a vote. Man, right. I don't know that that really exists. Yeah, Let's just go ahead and do it. We'll just vote on the amendment first. Okay. Everyone in favor of the amendment to Gloria's to, to the Gloria's motion say aye, please. Aye. aye. Any opposed or abstaining? Nay. Okay. 
and motion carried. All right, those in favor, um, we need a roll call vote, Amy, on Gloria's motion as amended as it passed. Garten? Aye. Junk? Aye. Borieri? Aye. Martin? Aye. Judy Hansen? Aye. Betcher? Aye. Okay, thank you very much. On item 24, David. Thank you. Um, item 24 is the uh, tree trimming and removal program. And I understand that Keith Abraham was going to be available to speak to this. Is, is Keith here? Yes, I am. So could you, uh, um, do you have any news for us on this? Do you want to clarify, David, what, what your question was? Yes, we did receive an inquiry about a concern that one of our residents had with this contract. And um, I understand that, that maybe you were able to learn something about this concern. Yes. So, so with, uh, so with uh, the email that was provided, um, that email was sent to Paul Kalki, who's our city forester. And that was sent sometime after July 1st of 2019 when Fitz was awarded the contract for tree trimming. Um, in her email, the this incident that she, re, um, she referred to happened in early summer of 2019, which was before Fitz was awarded or Fitz actually started um, the tree trimming contract with the, the city of Ames. Um, that situation also, it was a private contractor with a, with a homeowner and the tree that was removed was not in the, the right of way um, because Pitts had not had the, the contract yet. So, so with um, Paul Tauke, our city forester, when he did, uh, um, when Pitts, before they started, he sat down with the owner, Brandon Pitts, sat down and said, hey, with uh, this is your first contract with the, the city of Ames for tree trimming. And, and he laid out all of the expectations that, that we expect as a city, you know, from our contractors regarding responsiveness, regarding um, respect to the property owners and, and so on. Um, since they've had the contract in July 1st of 2019, we have not had anybody contact us about a, a negative experience with, um, with pits. In fact, um, we have found them to be very responsive um, if there is a situation that we have seen that maybe they didn't perform to the standard that we wanted, we have contacted them and they have gone back and done it without any complaining. Um, in fact, yesterday even, there was a situation that um, Paul had seen a, a hanging branch you know, over a sidewalk. We could not get it with our um, truck. He called uh, Pitts and Pitts went and, and uh, took care of it. They called Paul about 5.30 last night and said, hey, we went and looked at it, we took care of it. So so we have been very happy and we have not had any negative experiences since they've been under contract with the city of Ames. I think that's a great explanation. I don't have any other questions and ready for a motion and no. I'm ready. I would move approval. All right. Is there a second? I can. Who was that? Was that uh, Rachel? Amber. Amber, thank you. All right. Roll call, please. Right. Junk? Aye. Moriari? Aye. Martin? Aye. Lee Hansen? Aye. Fetcher? Aye. Martin? Aye. Thank you. Moving on to public forum. This is a time that's set aside for the public to address council on matters of city business other than those that are listed on the agenda. And is there anyone, Brian, that you have, um, is a asking to uh, address council under public forum this evening. Mayor, I do not see anyone with their hand raised. Okay. We will go ahead and close public forum then, and we'll move on to item 31, resolution approving preliminary plat for 321 State Avenue. Steve, do we have staff available to discuss and make a presentation? 
Oh, we should be here or just just a moment. Just a second. Transition takes a second. Here we got a few people here. Uh, Justin Moore is the project planner. He uh, being moved over to present the project. All right. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here. soon as I'm uh, able to. All right. Okay, hopefully everybody can see the screen now. <laughs> All right, so um, this is a preliminary plat for Baker's subdivision uh, located at 321 State Avenue. Uh, this is uh, the preliminary plat for the mixed income development, uh, which is a minimum of 51% of the homes being uh, affordable for uh, low to moderate income households. Uh, we, the city of uh, Ames, are the developer uh, for this project. So the uh, preliminary plat that you see here is um, virtually identical to uh, Concept F. Concept F uh, was uh, chosen by you, the city council, uh, back in February uh, after discussion and outreach with uh, neighborhood, uh, neighborhood groups and neighbors uh, to the site. Uh, we uh, held a few different meetings uh, with them and um, had uh, meetings with you as well. And the direction that we had was uh, to pursue concept F, which is uh, what you see there before you. The um, uh, proposed preliminary plant uh, is uh, a, a, a configuration of 27 lots. 26 of those are for single family uh, developments. The 27th uh, that you see there south of Trip Street is for future multifamily development. The, um, I'll go through some of the features of the site here just real quick. Uh, south Wilmoth Avenue, which is located here to the west, uh, west side of the subdivision, will have uh, 13 lots fronting on it and they will gain access from South Wilmoth. Uh, they're designed and lined up similar to the existing uh, single family homes across the street. There are another um, uh, group of lots that are configured around this loop street here, uh, which will be called Latimer Lane. Uh, this uh, loop street will have uh, an out lot in the middle and the uh, planned use for that outlot is for a uh, pocket park, uh, which will be owned by the city of Ames and maintained by the uh, Parks and Recreation Department. So the, um, the subdivision right now, or the land right now, actually uh, contains Trip Street, which was built in 2019, which goes east to west there. So the development will only require the construction of Latimer Lane uh, there to the north. The um, one of the features that is discussed in the report uh, that I'll focus here on a little bit was placement of the shared use path. Uh, the uh, path that you see there across the top of your screen. I'll zoom in here in just a moment so uh, you can uh, get a better idea of what I'm talking about. The shared use path is part of the larger network uh, of the shared use path south of Lincoln Way. And that's a shared use uh, path for bikes and pedestrians that will go from Campus Town uh, to Dotson Drive. And um, from Planning and Zoning Commission earlier this month, 
uh, between then and now, we um, had a uh, redesign of the trail, uh, relocation of the trail slightly. So uh, the original proposed location that we showed planning and zoning back uh, earlier in the month was along the north edge of the property that the subdivision will be on. And we've had discussions with uh, the public works department and the electric department as well um, due to the fact that there are abutting electric lines right along the property line here uh, and the proximity of the trail to the existing gravel alley uh, just to the north of this site. And um, what we've come to is a design uh, proposed to hold both a paved alley slash trail design. Uh, this will be compatible to the way the trail will be designed to the west here, uh, west of South Wilmoth. Uh, it will run with the alley for a ways. So this proposal uh, that we're showing you tonight includes a paved alley over to where the alley would meet the right of way for Manning Avenue, which goes north. At that point, the trail will leave uh, the alley and exit or come back on to the, the subdivision site and will run in a 20 foot wide out lot uh, over to State Avenue. The shared use path uh, here in this out lot is a 10 foot wide uh, shared use path. Um, the uh, design is to facilitate stormwater as you see here down to the uh, southeast, the southeast corner of the property. Um, it will be detained and released according to standards down there. Uh, just east of the future multifamily lot. There also is down here um, where I'm showing the cursor across the very bottom edge, uh, the south edge of the uh, subdivision, there is some proposed floodplain. Uh, it is uh, what we call floodway fringe. It's the 100 year floodplain. Uh, and it is all down here contained in the south part of outlaw Z, which um, uh, comes down from the north and then extends to the west uh, right there at the south end. Uh, most of the lots are pretty similar in size. We do have some some larger lots configured around uh, Latimer Lane uh, facing the uh, future pocket park. And um, we, um, we also do uh, have the pond designed at this time for um, the potential for a future fish stock and a DNR classification uh, that would be pursued in the future by public works. Um, and in our contract, that will be a, um, a, an alternate option or a, um, an option that could be changed if bids come in too high, could be reduced back to a standard design. Uh, that would be, uh, again, the fish stock certification would be pursued by public works. And uh, the maintenance of that, if there's any paths or benches, would, uh, would fall to the city. Uh, one thing we do note in the report tonight is uh, we do not have a final cost for the paved alley trail configuration to the north. So we do hope to finalize that soon, and we'll certainly have that prior to the final plat uh, later next month. So with that, uh, I can uh, take any questions from the council. Hey, council, questions for Jason. Justin, could you just real quickly go through the two options on the bike trail again on why, why what you're recommending is the preference over the other option? Sure. So the, um, the configuration that we originally had, which was the bike trail, it would have been a 10 foot wide uh, shared use path, which it's still proposed as uh, on the site versus the uh, combined alley design um, is to uh, help uh, facilitate for both the um, uh, relocation of the electric lines in conjunction with being able to maximize the room uh, that's available on the single family home lots that uh, abut back up to it. Uh, this will actually allow the homeowners to gain um, approximately uh, 15 extra feet, 10 to 15 extra feet on the rear side of their lots. Uh, rather than have that that extra outlot uh, in there along that portion of the the property line, 
there still will be a, um, a 10 foot public utility easement, but that 10 foot public utility easement would have been uh, further south uh, under the um, uh, original design that was that was originally proposed. So what's, I'm sorry, so the, oh, are, we, are we not bearing the electrical there? Um, the final design for the undergrounding of the electric, uh, it's not quite been finalized, but the reason we do have that PUE there is to facilitate that if need be. So uh, the poles right now are right up against the property line just inside the alley uh, that see. exists to the north. Uh, so when those get undergrounded, we do have that PUE there. So based on the final design, if, if the lines do need to go under there, they can uh, be accommodated. And then, so do the properties to the north, do, are they accessed through this alley? The properties to the north do have, I believe there are two or three of these properties that do have direct access out onto the alley. So are there any kind of safety concerns by placing the configuration in the alley? So the, the proposed uh, width, final paved width of the alley will be a 16 foot wide paved area. Um, based on the discussions with uh, traffic in uh, public works, um, they believe that uh, that is a, a safe design. Um, they believe that the, the usage of the alley is low enough and um, that the, the combined traffic would uh, not be an issue uh, in this particular situation uh, with those those few properties that access. There, there, just as a heads up, there might be some value in some signage along there. So if you ride that, that, um, that trail further to the west, I mean, there aren't any situations where um, cyclists are having to pay attention to um, uh, driveways. And so there may be some value um, in alerting cyclists as they come up there uh, to, to watch for, for cars there. Um, the other uh, question I had, and I'm going to blame this on Bronwyn, she's, she's got me thinking about community gardens. And, and I'm wondering, as we think about projects, is if there was an interest in doing something, there's so much land here. I wonder if, if um, we just sort of left this to Parks and Rec, and if they found that a, a location that would be desirable, um, maybe there'd be some opportunities there for community garden. Is that something we can sort of leave open ended? Yeah, I don't, Tim, this is Kelly. I, we weren't programming that, that park space right now. We were setting up basically as clean and green to give to Parks and Rec and then have them work through what would go in that space. So that's that's something if, if they found desirable a year or two from now, they could always reprogram that into city land. Yeah, absolutely. That's all the questions I had. Thank you. Very good. Other questions for uh, Justin? So, Justin, is there potential with any of these larger lots? Uh, should the city end up changing our zoning to allow accessory dwelling units for there to be any of those on any of those lots? I think, I think um, I'll take that one, Gloria. I guess without knowing what our standards would be, it's really hard to say right now. The, when we do the multifamily development to the south, we may rezone the, the whole property to PRD. And at that time, we could add in allowances for accessory living units. But I don't think that we would think that an affordable housing probably has the financial wherewithal to also support a uh, second living unit on the property. I'm not sure that that's going to really happen here. Anything else, Gloria? Uh, no, that's it. Anybody else have questions for Justin or Kelly? Justin, on uh, your alternative uh, trail and alley, are you going to be taking an alternate? I mean, it talks about the fact that maybe you won't do it because of cost. Is that going to be that decision going to be made based on bid or based on budget? Um, I think certainly it would be based on budget. We hopefully get a better uh, idea um, from Public Works here very soon. 
Um, we've gotten kind of a preliminary estimate at this point, uh, but they're not hard final numbers. Uh -huh. um, once we do have our consultant engineer put together uh, more of a, a specific uh, project cost with the public improvement documents, uh, we'll know more of what we're dealing with. So um, certainly we could uh, facilitate back to uh, something like the original design if we needed to, to save money. So if you need to go back to the original design, would that require uh, a change in the plat then because you'd have smaller lots along the north side of that property? So it would require an amendment uh, because we could potentially be placing it back in an out lot. Um, we would hope to know that fairly soon uh, so that we could fit that into uh, the near future in our timeline here as we move forward toward final plat. I was just trying to think of ways to try and help keep this on on track and not have the bids come in over. We're starting to see bids come in on a lot of projects, you know, over budget, and all of a sudden have to go back and redo it. And just trying to think through is there, you know, an alternate bid that could be put in there that would allow you to pull the trigger one way or the other. But then that would require an amendment. That would just come back to council, correct, for, a, for an amendment. Correct. Yeah, and, and Mr. Mayor. I I think we're going to set this up as a bit alternate and it may be done as a whole separate project where it's not part of the first edition. Okay. We're hoping to have some flexibility on the bidding with that to maybe ease cost concerns also. Now I'm, I'm coming from having worked with non non city partner, so to speak, uh, projects. Typically a utility will charge money to put underground, you know, electric lines underground. Is that going to be part is that charge going to be incurred by this project? And so how much is that going to cost to go underground with uh, wiring for the uh, mains there? So the, the way that it's going to work, because the current electric poles are in a right of way, okay. this electric will have to pay for the cost of relocation of the electric lines themselves. They have a fund uh, in their budget for doing that. I think the, um, the numbers estimated right now grossly at about fifty thousand dollars to do all of the work necessary to relocate the line from underground. Okay, I just didn't know if that was going to be part of the uh, home funds or CDBG, you know, funds had to pay for that. That would take away from the other project or how that would work. Uh, Mayor, this is Donald Com. Can I chime in here on Absolutely, this? Absolutely, because I have some questions uh, for you too, Don. All right, thank you. So. One of the neat things about this project is both with planning and housing, electric and uh, public works being involved by the nature, part of what benefits us is, is as that road gets um, paved, as the bike path and road get paved, um, that allows us then we have funds specifically designated for when a public works does a road project. So that gives us the lion's share of the money then to take that uh, overhead line and put it underground. Okay. Typically with developers, it's the developer's cost to put in the conduit, and then we pick up all of the other costs, and those are some of the details that we're still looking at and working on this project. But the lion's share of the cost will be picked up uh, if and when the road is is paved and the and the bike trails put in. And that's that's how we bring money into the into the project. Okay. So while you're on the line, Don. Um, yes, sir. I uh Greatly appreciate the creativity of everyone coming up with that idea of trying to do a community groundwater source heat pump system, you know, geothermal. Um, can you talk about how far along that design is? And um, isn't there a, Justin, is there a, a map, or at least in our packet there was, showing the well layout as the last, the last page of uh, our handout? Yeah, let me see if I can uh, pull that up here and get that on the screen. Just so everyone can, uh, who might be watching online or watching on TV, can see it. Right. Let's see black lines on black paper, Justin. Take me just a moment here.
Yeah. Sorry, I thought it'd be faster if you could just talk through it, I guess. All right, I uh, got it here. Ah, there we go. There you are. All right, so I think, Mayor, your question to me was, you know, kind of where we're at in this project. So we've had a preliminary design, as you can see from the drawing, where we would lay out, basically, it would be uh, electric utilities responsibility to have a contractor put in the wells and, and own, maintain, operate the basic well system that then would feed all of the individual homes. Um, if and when the, the expansion to the multi um, dwellings uh, happened, we would be looking then at either expanding this or looking at a second well formation. We have not uh, finalized that yet. Uh, for many people that are familiar with ground source heat pumps, um, they're very, very efficient. Um, typically, they're done. You have a ground source heat pump uh, or a well, and then that feeds an individual home. The concept that we're working on here, in this, and we're not the first to come up with it, but, but we're one of the first to look at this particular design, what it does is, is typically ground source heat pumps are extremely expensive. And so only people that have a lot of money are able to put this in. In our particular case, because we're able to put in the basic infrastructure, um, we can actually bring very economic, very low cost energy, heating and cooling, and specifically to these homes that will um, beat any other form of, of heating and cooling. So that's the idea that we're, we're bringing to the table. It's, um, it's preliminarily designed. Um, in fact, we'll probably be coming back to council at the next council meeting or the next couple of council meetings to go over our concept in more detail. But we wanted to make sure that at least uh, as you're looking at 321, that uh, you at least hear of what we're looking at. This has been taken to your RAB. URAB has supported this and want, wants us to bring this to council in the very near future. Okay. Um, I have a question for Don. So Don, would the expectation be that the city would maintain this system indefinitely? Yes, this would become a city asset. So you know, are there any other examples where the city maintains anything comparable to this? The city of Ames? No. Other cities, yes. There are some other cities that, that have been working on projects similar to this. What makes ours is somewhat unique is this is considered, a, in essence, a greenfield site. So there are no homes. This is like a, a virgin development, if you will, where in a lot of the other places where it was um, looked at, and there's not a lot of them, they basically tried to do this into existing homes. And the real savings is in that existing home uh, or with existing homes, you've already got existing infrastructure. This would allow the homes to be built and designed specifically to make maximum use of the um, ground source heat pump system. So I, I love the idea. I'm just, I'm going to need some help in loving the idea that this is something that we would take on as an obligation the rest of the taxpayers um, are going to be um, putting the bill for this indefinitely. And I'm no, yeah, there's no taxpayer money involved. This is uh, electric utility funds. So this would be borne by the electric utility rate payers. Okay. So um, it's the same people just with different hats on. Um, uh, I'm just throwing this out for consideration. Would it be possible to have the homeowners set up a, a homeowner association, and then this would be an obligation of that they would take on. So, the the model we now we use now all the time is when we do a development. If there are common elements, then we ask that an HOA be set up to take care of the mowing or snow removal or taking care of the pool, whatever the common elements are. Um, I'm I'm just a little challenged to try to to be supportive of something the city's going to be responsible for long term the system fails at some point needs to be replaced um then we're going to be asking our, our rate payers to take on that that task and there's also the precedent you know if we do this here are there going to be some other situations i don't know it just 
I didn't catch that when I first went through this, and it's causing me a little bit of pushback. Well, Tim, can I, can I speak up to Steve? I think the electric utility is getting involved, not just because they support affordable housing. Uh, I think, Don will correct me if I'm incorrect, but we're going to pay for this on our demand side management. So think that is it. absolutely correct. This is uh, another method we're trying to look at how we can reduce the demand on our electric system as our, in this case, our housing, uh, housing grows in the future. Um, we're taking out of our demand side management budget. It should be seen as a pilot project. We'll study it, and we're not committing to one other subdivision past this. Uh, we're, you're committing to a community a community um, solar farm that we're going to watch too. You know, we're not sure if it's going to break even. We're going to sell enough uh, sell enough shares that we're going to not have to socialize that into the system too. So we're going to have to prove: is this another technique for lowering our demand? which in that sense delays an expensive expansion to our power plant, which all of us will have to pay for. It may not be a good tool. It may be a good tool. We always want to try something different as we're trying a community solar uh, project right now. So think of it as a demand side management technique. You want to add to that, Don? No, I think you covered it well, Steve. Um, and that that's the beauty of this is, is these things, this system is so much better than an air conditioner. It will keep our peak down, um, and uh, it actually helps in greenhouse gases too. Because in essence, by doing this, these, these this area becomes electric. Um, there won't be any natural gas being used for heating or anything like that, and that that will very much help our greenhouse gas initiatives. So think of this as a pilot, as an experiment. Are you willing to take the risk for us to study it? We may prove afterwards that we don't want to move ahead again and just replicate this. It's an unusual opportunity for us since we are a developer on this to take the chance on this. We think the homeowners will benefit because they will come away with lower total utility costs when you combine their gas their gas fee, uh, rates with their electric rates. Their uh, monthly payment should be less. But the utilities are getting engaging in this as a demand side management technique, which may or may not prove out. We're using it as a laboratory, a test, a pilot project. So Don, are you saying then that you would not have any natural gas in any house? That would be our intent, correct. So they'd have an electric water heater? Yes, sir. Actually, we're looking at uh, solar water heaters. On site? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, to, to bring this, I think I would like to the plot for a second. So, so I think, <laughs> and, and Steve have said, is they're going to come back to you with more specifics about the, the geothermal as a pilot project from the housing side of this as the as the applicant for the project. Our layout and design can accommodate it. You're not approving the full geothermal tonight until you get more information. I, I appreciate that, Kelly. That's good. Okay. Correct. Um, did you have a question, David, on the, the geothermal so or you want to just pass on uh, that? It, it was along those lines. I, I'm looking, I, it's good that we're thinking about this early, um, but I'm looking forward to a more substantial conversation about it later. Okay. John, a final question. And I, um, do we have any examples of other communities that have done something similar? I'm, uh, I, I like the idea a great deal. Um, don't, don't take my, my, uh, curiosity about how we're going to pay for it long term to be uh, anything, but you know, I'm, not, I'm still very supportive of the project. I'm just trying to figure out the pay we will pay for it. But are there other communities that have done something similar that we could look to? There are probably I'd have to get the exact list, but there's probably several dozen that have done this across the country. I think I'm aware of one or possibly two in Iowa, and I'd have to get out the specifics. And we can definitely go through that uh, when we come back to the board to the council. That would, that would be helpful. I appreciate the fact that we don't have to fine tune that point tonight, but um, if we had some data about what the potential cost would be um, for maintenance going into the future, if, if it's a nominal cost, then I don't want to fall on my sword over this. Um, the fact that we're doing something really unique uh, that would be very positive, I think would, think it would make these units very attractive. Uh, for people, if they knew they could get the utilities much lower and it helps with our carbon footprint, there are a lot of win-wins here. Um, I don't want to fixate on one small detail, but it'd be helpful to know. 
Okay. Thanks. Um, I just have one more question for Justin. And Justin, is on the drainage, the surface drainage, I was just looking at that, again, just kind of coming at it from a, if I was to develop some of these lots, is this, is what you're showing at the grading plan actually what they're anticip what they're going to plan on turning over to uh, um, to the uh, people who purchased the properties to develop them? So the the grading plan uh, that I pulled up there on the screen. So that would be the grade of the site um, upon our uh, us finishing it uh, for as far as infrastructure um, the home construction uh, as the homes are constructed each site will likely require some additional grading for obviously for building pads and, and that sort of thing um, the the drainage of the site uh, there are swales uh, in certain locations on the site with overland flowage easements um, the properties along south wilmoth the the flowage is along the rear uh, to the north and the south and then there is some along trip as well. And then the same along the rear of these um, uh, around Latimer Lane. So they do um, uh, drain uh, both south and east. But again, with the grading, uh, as the houses are constructed, there will be additional grading to make the lots um, uh, easier to uh, construct homes on. Well, I and this is not germane to the motion that's on that topic regarding the uh, approving of the subdivision, but I didn't know to what level um, staff looks at, you know, the contours, but these are pretty narrow lots, you know, by council direction. And the sheet flow of the water is, is really going from lot to lot to lot. It's not going from the back of lot to the front of lot. And I was just trying to envision how, how they're going to be grading it and coordinating it so you don't have sheet flow of water going into your neighbors side of your house and uh i guess i was just expecting that there'd be more you know, that the, that the uh civil divine design advantage would have been trying to grade some of this lot so it'd be more conducive um mayor tracy's here maybe she can answer that question tracy's here yes i'm here Let's so go. typically with the lots we have the front yard that drains towards the street and then the backyard drains towards the swale and then in general the um, area that is draining to the street on south wilmeth is offset as a stormwater management plan um, which we have an approved stormwater management plan um, we've reviewed that with the design consultant and then there's water that is entering from the state avenue right away you can see that swale at the backyards right that is flowing down into the uh, detention basin as well, well i'm so, just looking at i'm looking at lots uh 14 15 16 you got sheet flow it's going essentially south southeast and then also lots you know nine through 13 along uh you know wilmoth um I'll, the only reason, reason, the only reason I'm bringing it up is that I just want to make sure that we don't have issues um, when you start developing it. Well, all of a sudden, you know, one developer is developing it one way and he throws all of his water, you know, next door. And then you got someone else is complaining about water getting in their basement because, you know, the drainage doesn't work very well. Um, it just, um, I'm just trying to forestall and make sure that we just don't have issues or problems that we're, you know, that's being built into the project, you know, long term. So, yeah, and I appreciate that, and we end up in subdivisions quite often with that problem. Um, so we're very conscious of it with designs, and so at the back of the lots nine through twelve, there that you were talking about, and uh, there's a swale and yep. also a collector it. line that will take the sump pump water, and so okay. that swale comes down and then that ends up into our storm sewer network. Yeah, but see it just north of a trip. Yes. Yep. Okay, so, so I, I, I just- I'll have I, I, water flow through the yards, but that's, um, it should be just with uh, falling and then uh, draining down to that storm sewer system, which gets to the desertion basin. All I wanna make sure is that it's being thought of and we just don't have, I'm just trying to avoid. <laughs> 
headache for staff and for the developers and for, you know, and the people that are building on this, you know, LMI, you know, you know, residents, they're not going to have a lot of resources to try and go back and fix things if we have lots of erosion problems or whatever. So as long as you've looked at it and everyone's comfortable that this is going to be a great design and it's going to take care of all the stormwater issues, you know, surface drainage, um, I'm certainly satisfied with that. So just want to make sure that we are thinking about that. And we appreciate that. And we'll make sure that Jake Moore, our stormwater specialist, he visits the sites uh, before the final occupancy is completed. So we will make sure that he's out there and he looks at the drainage because, well, we can mass grade and make these set up for the home. The home builders often um, see things a little differently and sometimes they'll put a little different touch on things. And so then we need to, to make sure that it complies with the plan. And so um, Jake or Liz Calhoun or myself um, can make sure that, that we visit each of these sites before they're occupied. I, I just want to clarify, I wasn't expecting that you would grade every site for a house, first of all. It was just more or less, in my experience, these are probably bought and not all developed all at once. They're going to be developed by over a period of time. And usually the first one in gets to decide how, you know, what finished floor elevation they set, which way the water is going to go. And all of a sudden you might have someone saying, well, this really stinks. And then all of a sudden you push a nerve problem down the road. So it's a challenging site. I mean, there's a lot of grade drop on it. Um, it's going to be seen by all, all, all those lines. And so I just want to make sure that we're not, if this is a flatter site, it wouldn't be really big an issue. But there's so much so much grade drop and so much water flow. I just want to make sure we don't, that, you know, going down the road, we don't have all kinds of headaches and, and issues um, that people just get, leave their heads scratching and saying, gee, how's it, how this come about? So, And we get submissions for uh, erosion control permits for each of the individual home lots. So mm -hmm. we could make sure as we look at those that it gets compared to the grades on this plan and make sure that those are going to comply. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Any other council questions? Otherwise you entertain. Oh, first of all, any other questions for staff before let's open up public input. Hearing none, uh, it opened up uh, public comment on this item. Brian, is there anybody that has indicated interest and in wanting to address council on this topic? Uh, yes, Mayor. I see Tony and Debbie Ramey, and I will unmute them right now. Okay, if you'd introduce, your, introduce yourself and your address, and then please uh, proceed. Hi, this is Tony Ramey, and I live at 425 Hilltop Road. And uh, I'm just really encouraged by the discussion I'm hearing and also by this proposal and all the cool stuff that you're planning to do in this. Um, as, a, as this being part of our, our Greater Neighborhood Association, um, I'm hopeful that this is going to pull the neighborhood up. And what I'm hearing is that there's a very good chance that's going to happen. And so um, my only concern is that a lot of the cool stuff that's written up in here is subject to budget. Um, and so any and all, many of this, these good things could end up dropping out of it if the money's not there. So I'm just very hopeful that that will not happen and that all this stuff will actually stay as, as proposed here. And and I hope the same care goes into when the houses get built um, and when the shared uh, um, multi-use housing gets built and all that stuff. I hope the same level of, of consideration as what I'm hearing tonight about, about the infrastructure goes into those as well. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank so, you, Tony. Thank you. Anybody else, Brian? Uh, no, Mayor, I don't see anyone else, but um, just as a reminder to the phone participants, if you would like to raise your hand, you can press star nine and we'll receive an indication that you want to speak on an item. And can you describe where they can go ahead and access the uh, raise your hand feature on the uh, menu? Uh, on the menu for computer users, it's at the bottom of the screen. There should be a button that says raise hand. Uh, I see one more um, person, Joanne Pfeiffer. I'm going to unmute Joanne right now. Okay. Hi, Joanne. 
Uh, well, I'm sorry. Hang on just one moment. Joanne, if you'd like to speak, if you'd like to just raise your hand again. And I have nothing here to click. Hello, Joanne. Go ahead, Go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, your state your address, please. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, Joanne Pfeiffer, 3318 Morningside Street. And um, I just wanted to Tony's comments. I we this is very exciting to me, and I have a historical point. I believe my uncle invented the thermal heating system in Wisconsin, in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Thirty years ago, his house was thermal water heated. Is that something that you people who are working with this knew, or would that be accurate? Um, you want to continue with your comments? I just was wondering if. The oh, I, I think we'll just we'd like to have your comments, and then we'll go ahead and if there's yeah. a question, we'll. No, anyway, I am just very pleased with uh, with all the possibilities. It's okay. quite exciting. It's almost going to be a poster child. So, Joanne, was your question? Did we know that your uncle designed the system? Yes. Okay. Right. Anything else you wish to say? No. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Don, do you have an answer for that or not? Uh, I did not know that her uncle designed it. Uh, however, I know a lot of the work on this stuff was done in the upper Midwest, so it's kind of cool that it came from Wisconsin. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, we can take what he started and maybe improve upon it if, if he was the original designer. Thank you. Anything else, Brian? Anyone else? Uh, Mayor, I do not see anyone else with their hand raised. Okay, we'll close public input, council. Any further discussion? Otherwise, I entertain a motion on the one of the alternatives. I'll move to approve the preliminary plat. Second. Okay, moved by Martin, seconded by B.D. Hansen. Any yes. further discussion? Hearing none. Um, those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Roll call, sir. Pardon me? The resolution should be roll call. Uh, my apologies. The uh, council action form did not indicate this resolution, but you're right. The uh, agenda does call for resolution. Thank you very much for clarification. So we'll revote that. Uh, roll call, please. Corrieri? Aye. Martin? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Fetcher? Aye. Martin? Aye. Junk? Aye. Thanks for catching that. Very good. Moving on to item 33, resolution approving Ames 2040 and use map. All right. So, this is follow up from last Tuesday's workshop where we had a presentation from RDG about the draft land use designations and a, a citywide mapping of those designations. Tonight, what we're asking for is acceptance of the classifications uh, and also the, the generally described and applied to the map as presented last week. In the staff report, we did note five things that if you chose option one, that staff would continue to work on and refine. Uh, those were to correct mapping area, mapping error designations that we talked about, some of the university land mapping, some of the changes to the, to the boundaries of commercial and residential that were obviously not correct and would, would uh, need to be adjusted before finalizing it. We also talked about updating the commercial descriptions and how they were applied across the city just to better have uh, just a little bit different naming convention to have it maybe reflect more about how the city of Ames operates now. But we did talk about adding a new area just next to downtown as a core redirection area between 6th and 7th Street from Grand to Clark. 
And that was reflective of the fact that our current land use plan shows that area as a possibility. And, and staff in hearing council's comments last week really thought that reinforcing 6th Street as a downtown core area really made sense. So we're proposing to adjust that. We also talked about the Cherry Street extension. And if that Cherry Street extension was to happen to plan for possibility of commercial Macy's being served by that area as well. And then number five is one that um, is a little broader in, in how it would be to turn out. We were asked to revisit the neighborhood designation for traditional, especially south and west of campus. Uh, kind of look at the age of housing, look at the pattern of housing and see if, if established neighborhood or traditional neighborhood fit better. We haven't completed this work yet, so we couldn't bring that back to you tonight. Uh, we understood the intent of that discussion. So if you're comfortable with what you discussed last week, we would go back with RDG and revisit some of those areas and probably make some adjustments to reflect some of the older neighborhoods around those areas. Uh, some of the things that we also discussed last week was the, the university overlay. During the workshop, we talked about it as it's probably best being an overlay, and we did show a version of that where it was following the rental code near campus neighborhoods. We would continue forward absent any other direction to use that overlay. But we also noted, though, that in areas that were specifically shown for redevelopment, that they would be kept as a redevelopment type of designation, whether that's a redirection area, an urban corridor area, or a core area. In the single family areas, the university overlay would have a lot more meaning, it would be about balancing neighborhoods and looking for policies that support uh, stabilized neighborhoods versus where redevelopment is really first. Uh, so we don't have any new information to provide the United the staff report is laying out really two options. The first one is what I just went through. The second would be if council has more specific direction to us to give us that, and then we can decide if we need to bring it back to you or whether we can continue forward as we would under option. Kelly, would you uh, share with uh, those that are with council again, but also with uh, those who may be watching for the first time on this topic? Um, what's the process that we're going through? Because tonight there'll be no public input. This is really just council giving direction, but there will be opportunity for public to review and give input and for adjustments to be made in the future. Can you kind of talk about that, please? Yeah, so with the workshop schedule that, that we established for the next three months, staff in, the, in RDG are going to bring information to you in draft form uh, to give you an update on the progress and then seek direction and concept about this information. The idea is that through these next three months, which is April, May, and June, we'll be able to touch on all the remaining issues, get initial direction from council, and then we can package it up as a final draft that's ready for public review and comment. Uh, so the action tonight is to give direction to staff to finalize something. And the idea is that by July, we'll be able to have a public draft where people can see all of the direction that we've gotten, whether it's about housing or transportation or the environmental issues that are yet to come. And then we'll be having a longer public engagement process that's yet to be defined depending on how COVID turns out for the summer. But the idea is that for at least two months, we'll have a, a lengthy public engagement operate option for people to participate before council looks again at, at, um, at final action on this. And so let's just say for sake of discussion that there were some questions or issues on the land use map or the uh, land use categories and it wasn't just one person there was you know a, a consistent theme how does that work in terms of getting that back to council and can council still change or modify the land use map or these categories um, at a later date not extensively but i mean in terms of taking into account the public input yeah, and one thing that's kind of hard to visualize right now is that these, these workshops are based on giving you bullets to kind of get the main idea across. But the final comprehensive plan is going to have to weave this stuff together as text and narrative as well to give you a more complete picture. So one thing I would caution people is reading one bullet uh, and waiting that way too much about one bullet. You have to look at the whole package of the principles, understand the intent for some of these designations. But clearly, council, when they see it written, will be able to say, hey, that's not quite what we were thinking the meaning would be when we put this together as the final chapter. And you will be able to give us that input uh, before we go public. Uh, hopefully not revisit the whole thing, but if there's just nuances to it or details that are missing, we'll get that input before we go back to public. A case in point, like they had some cross-hatching that wasn't properly annotated, and if there's 
a small area here or there that we thought would be nice for redevelopment that could be inserted or changed or some verbiage in some of the text that could be altered as well too without doing a whole scale change is that correct yes yes i mean if there's something tonight you guys are are, are confident is wrong I, not just an error but you want to change what we propose we'd love to hear that tonight but yeah you know you'll have opportunities um through july to see the final package and make an adjustment in 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 uh in context versus in isolation yeah hey council questions just following up on that if we were to go with option one tonight uh, and uh, allow you to just work with the five topics as you described them when is the next time that we would be looking at the the map or and the designations or a form of the designations is that relatively sooner or is that something that we would that's kind of would be done for the time being until we deal with the other issues my guess is we wouldn't bring it back as a specific end individual issue on its own so if that's the case you wouldn't see it till july when everything is done okay thanks so kelly um with regard to number five with the um the review of the residential neighborhood categories and, and which neighborhoods fit do we need to give you specific direction on how we want you to look at that or is it enough that on the 21st we discuss that categorization of uh, established neighborhood versus traditional for the near campus neighborhoods i think you have two options gloria if, if you don't give us any specific direction tonight rdg and staff will go revisit it through the lens of how we think of the overall category and I'm, I'm pretty sure we would probably recommend changes to some areas. I don't know how extensive it would be right now. We haven't gone through the exercise. Or city council could say, I just know that from this street to this street, I want it to be traditional designation. We would just make that change. So I think when I asked you about this, you told me that it, it was actually the case that the traditional designation offers a little bit more flexibility um, whereas the established neighborhood definition the policies actually are more restrictive which i think i didn't understand on the 21st and and i guess based on some of the emails we received others were not understanding that either i know that there's concern among near campus neighborhoods especially given our our previous attempts to have the um rental housing cap overlay placed on those neighborhoods. Would we need to give you direction on how to apply that university um, overlay in order to ensure that those areas that are the most threatened are getting the most protection? So in the, in the draft last week, we did put the overlay on the map. So if you're okay with how we showed it last week, we would just continue forward that way. If there were other edits, again, we would want to hear that if it's different than what was shown. And I think that the conversation about which um, category is more restrictive, I think that's something that's going to be yet to be determined with how you view the final language of the chapter. What's, what's a, a little bit of a tricky element here for RDG and staff to work through was the general idea of of allowing for maybe some small changes in existing neighborhoods, but not allow for wholesale change unless it was designated for regional. Um, and trying to indicate some selective change is okay, but in general, it's not expected. That's probably where there's variability here in what people are reading and what they might be imagining. Uh, so that's that's something that I'm going to encourage you to pay attention to as we give you this in final form is to make sure we're striking the right balance. And the reason I say that the traditional might be viewed as more flexible is because it already has more housing types in it than most established neighborhoods. So if you're trying to balance two family, three family, single family homes, small apartment buildings, those exist in many traditional neighborhoods. Very few established neighborhoods have that pattern. So if, if you're looking at those two descriptions, you can see why more building types are accommodated in traditional than established. So if we just leave you to your own devices, you're going to be assuming that, that there will be the, the overlay where it is on the map now, 
and then you would go back and review the which definition is applied to the neighborhoods um, as the base category. Yes. Okay. Um, my second question is with regard to the redirection area south of Campus Town, um, which I expressed concern about last week and which we received a couple of emails about from people who live over here. Um, do we need to decide as a council whether that redirection area has specific guidelines, for example, being a transition zone versus um, what's allowable in Campus Town with up to seven story buildings? So I think that's a good point for clarification. So when, uh, if you could turn um, screen share on for me, whoever is supposed to be. I could bring up the area that, that Gloria is talking about. Uh, so we, we had a, a little bit of a discussion on this last week. I described a, a situation where you could view that redirection area as allowing for intense redevelopment because we have fielded as, as planning staff questions about an extension of campus town further south than where it is. And then we also had uh, Marty from RDG talking about, well, how do you view this as a transition to the single family area? Is, is it more of a four story kind of environment versus a six or seven story kind of environment? So you had two different pictures kind of described to you. Uh, and right now it's just indicating change. So some direction um, on that would be preferable. I think uh, I think you heard two different ways you could look at that from both staff and from, from RDG. And I can bring up the map right now and help focus this in. Does everybody see the map right now? Yes. Okay, so I'm trying to zoom in to south of campus down here. So this is that specific area that we were talking about uh, between Knapp and Hunt, uh, kind of south of, of campus town. And this is where we talked about two different ideas about how future change might, might fit into the area. And the only thing I encouraged you to do without saying do one over the other, if you think something more aggressive is possible, I said indicate that now and pull back from that from public comment versus start small and then go up in intensity from public comment. Um, generally, people react into reduction more agreeably than they do to intensification. Still, the designation redirection doesn't really say which of those it is. Correct. So I, I would say this is the one that's probably the most open to discussion. RDG probably would have uh, landed in describing it more as that uh, transitional area based on the infill exercise that they did back in December. So there, they were thinking for the most part, it was probably a transitional area, meaning it was in, in that four story ish or less range, which is similar to the zoning that's there now. It's just the properties have never been aggregated to do this. Yeah, and I think that um, if you look at what has been developed on Welch, which is a high density zone south of Knapp, um, we have several three-story apartment complexes there. So it would make sense that this redirection area may be a step down from the, the seven-story to a four-story to a three-story where the three stories are, are actually intermingled with the homes. And I'm I'm still very interested in us giving direction that this area be a transition zone to a single family neighborhood rather than having what happened on uh, Sheldon with the uh, seven story union building butted right up against the single family neighborhood, which has a very sharp um, edge to it. And it does. And, and going back when we made that decision, it was definitely a sharp edge. We had an, an, an intent for that kind of design right there. But looking to the west, we also said, well, the corridor plan would be the step down from it. And the three stories was probably the likely life or the likely redevelopment options on um, that block to the west. So right now, there is no transition. I think forward looking, we expected that there would be. Here, you're, you're talking about the transition occurring. 
we're not planning for any other transition south of NAP. So that's really the question is, is there a abrupt change or is there a transition? And it looks, it depends on what your goals are for redevelopment. So Kelly, what do you what what do you uh, need from council? Do you need some kind of a motion regarding this specific area? It, it would be preferable, yes. Um, otherwise, I think uh, you're leaving it up to RDG and staff to to, to formulate a final answer for you. Uh, and I said Marty would probably lean towards transition based on what his comments were last week. And is there based on what Gloria was just sharing? Is there a category that you would? suggest this being renamed to or just a motion that would give a description of what is looking what they're looking for um and then let you got let uh staff come up with a label for it i would say a description is what we're looking for so the other redirection areas i think it was a little clearer uh because it wasn't as debatable about transition versus intensity so the idea in the redirection areas is that they'll have this generic label but when you're in the land use map or the chapter itself, there will be a, a little vignette or something that talks about the expectations for that area. So I think describing the goal for this area is what we need to hear. Uh, we probably would not change the map designation. Then. So, Mayor, would you like a motion on that? Yes, yeah, so I want to just keep going on this. So if you want to, Gloria, go ahead. So I would move that the redirection area south of campus town be designated as a transition area where we see intensification but no buildings taller than four stories is is okay. that good enough direction kelly or do you need more um no that's specific there's a second second all right amber seconded thank you discussion I'd like to hear from other council members. Um, uh, there are other cons there are other voices and other priorities. Uh, this has been an area where we have prioritized intensification. Um, I don't think there's much possibility of substantial development in the near future with the vacancy rate where it, where it is now, but this is a, a long-term plan. And so this is something that we'd say in the event that there was market demand, um, then this would be an area um, to to vote on this so quickly without any more robust conversation than one voice. I don't, I don't think does this um, the the twenty forty plan justice. Now again, we can always come back and, and get more public input, but uh, seems like we should have a broader conversation given the history of intensification in this area. Tim, you've got two emails that I forwarded to you earlier today from one from the South Campus Area Neighborhood Association and one from people who live on Hayward. So you haven't, you have more than just by voice and I didn't talk to these people, so. So Tim, you're inviting council discussion. That's where we're at right now is the motion and made and seconded, but now it's time for conversation and discussion. I have a question. Um, maybe Kelly can address this. If, um, if developers are, are looking for places to do the sort of um, larger intensification you're discussing, like maybe up to seven stories or something like that. Um, is there, um, I guess two questions. Do you, um, uh, you find the, that there, that it's plausible that there's sufficient demand for that sort of housing? And then secondly, is, um, is it fair to say that you're not aware of any other area of the map shown that would be appropriate for that sort of thing? I think, um, I mean, no one's pounding at my door in the last few months to talk about more student housing. That's absolutely true. A lot of time why they were asking about this was to get out of the restrictions of the university impact overlay, which had extra parking requirements. So it was a combination of of increased density by going to the campus town standards, but also to reduce the parking requirement to facilitate it. Uh, so if you did one without the other, uh, if you reduce parking but kept lower building requirements, I think you would still see redevelopment, but at a different scale. Uh, it's if you needed a lot of parking, then they need a lot of building to make up the, the cost of doing that. And then the other area, I guess, to, to respond to your second part was 
we did talk about to the west of campus in that village area that a lot of that is already built but there are certain properties that can probably change but we also talked about the village area probably being in that same four or five story kind of um, range uh, what, what practically happens is that 75 foot height is a practical limit in building construction uh, because of the changes in how fire code and other elements come into play so 75 feet whether it's five stories or six stories is really the number that, that people are looking at to, to go to 100 feet or to go to 8, 10 or 11 stories is a totally different kind of approach to development so i'm not thinking that most places are looking for um, small towers kind of scattered around campus at this point and if i could follow up on your your first answer it, did I hear you say something like the um, developers might not even been looking for the super tall buildings? It was just that they were looking for something that could scale better and that didn't have these intense parking requirements. So for sure, they wanted to lower the parking requirement, so the lower cost of development. Uh, and then I think it depended on who would visit with me, yeah. whether they were really intent on the scale of the project being so large or they were really just trying to get rid of the parking. It was probably both camps. It just depended on who would make the inquiry. Okay, thanks. Okay, Tim raised a question about uh, a, a robust discussion regarding specification council. What are your thoughts? Well, that was kind of David's question right is there's some chance for intensification there even if with the four-story limit right and if developers aren't aren't looking to build or haven't in the past come asking to build a seven-story building there then that seems i think it seems like an okay compromise what gloria is proposing so it would still allow intensification but it's somewhat limited, um, but not so limited that we're gonna, yeah, really hamper what anybody's asked to do so far. So I, I guess I feel like it's somewhat, re it seems reasonable to me. Yeah, I tend to agree. I, at first I thought we were heading down the direction of no intensification. And, you know, hearing Kelly talk about traditional versus established neighborhoods, and then uh, looking at what I think is a realistic multifamily option, I feel a lot better about it than I did. And Kelly, what options, I mean, let's just say for sake of discussion, 10 years from now, all of a sudden there's a, a clamoring for taller buildings. This can still be modified, is that correct? By council action? Yeah, I think though the way it's um, being described, you'd probably see it as a as a comprehensive plan amendment. Uh, if we're gonna we're gonna put precise zones in by height or density, then and they can't meet those, they would have to have an amendment. Which is what we've done before in terms of land use uh, LUPP amendments, right? Right, right. So if there's a if there's a compelling need in the future, you probably wouldn't want to consider just one single property and probably want to revisit the whole area. Uh, and this would apply citywide. This isn't just about this one redirection area. That's how you should really view amendments going forward. Oh. Especially if you first adopt the plan, it should have some, some benefit to a broader area, not to just one single property. And I'm not trying to propose that all of a sudden it gets changed within a year. I'm just saying that this is not like forever and ever, um, and it never can be changed. It could be changed, but it's gonna take council action and a request and a rationale and a, and a vision for that area. Yeah, absolutely. So the point is, if, if the current council feels this is a better solution, we pass on this and we keep on moving on. Anybody else wanna uh, offer any opinion on this one? So a final point, um, we're doing this without student input. Devin's not here tonight. I don't know if Rachel, you have thoughts on this, but um, the, the constituency that we're not hearing from is half the population. And, and I would point out that students who want to live near campus town, or near campus, this providing additional intensification is a way of taking pressure off uh, the scan neighborhoods. So 
by by putting artificial constraints like this on intensification, what you're going to end up doing is driving more people into uh, converting single-family residential housing, owner-occupied housing, into into rentals. So by creating um, rental options in campus town, you're you're creating a relief for people who have give them other options. And so I think the I think there's an unintended consequence that you really don't realize what you're doing. But my broader point is that we're we're not hearing from half the population of the community. I think I think it's a poor decision. Rachel. Yeah, I was going to comment. Um, I do think that both the campus town core and the downtown core of Ames are going to have to expand in the next 20 years. Um, and I did kind of see this redirection area as a good spot for some more intensification. Um, I don't think that all of the really tall multifamily would necessarily have to be student centered either. I think it would be a good place that's walkable and bikeable, close proximity to campus for employees as well. Um, so I do think it could be possible to have greater intensification in that redirection area and still be um, an okay transition from maybe seven story to the three story on Welch and further south in those neighborhoods. Okay, everyone understand the motion? Those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. All right, that would be uh, Martin, Betcher, Bate Hansen, and Corey are ayes. And um, sorry, Junk and uh, Garten, nays. Motion carried. Anything else regarding this plan? Hearing none, is there a motion? I, Go ahead. I would just had a just a quick question, and it's more just selfish interest. What's the redirection area where Wheatsfield is? What's the vignette going to say about that one, Kelly? So that was also um, that was significant. So the the version that RDG showed you in in December was full sale. Uh, redevelopment of the neighborhood. It wasn't necessarily into high rise, but that to look at a concept that allowed for, for consolidation of those single family lots at the northwest edge of it into multi-family housing options. And then on the grand side of it, to look at more intense options to match kind of a downtown, um, kind of a shoulder area to downtown, which would be more intense. So that one was quite a bit different. It was one that was very much into wholesale change. So, so what, as I said before, the redirection label is generic, but there'll have to be a description about that. Yeah. That's, that's where that one would head. Okay. Of explaining it. Thank you. Yeah, I was just curious. That's, thank you. Are there comments or questions? Otherwise, entertain a motion on one of these options. Do you want to, do you want to have any further discussion on uh, the downtown area? So while I'm here, if I can just point out, this is the block that is in option one, right through here that I'm saying. Oh, we, we can't see your screen, Kelly. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to think about that. Okay, do you have a map again? There you go. All right, so so this is the area that, uh, that uh, Broadwin was just asking about where we feel the significant change. This block right here, between Grand and Clark is in option one as the area that we would show as red as part of the core, uh, reflecting that that idea that we want to match Sixth Street with, with the um, downtown intent. And just to be clear, it's both sides uh, of the block, right? Yeah, we would take it up to seven. Right. That's Thanks. the block. And so to John's point, um, if 10 years from now there was an interest in in the commercial area i mean if we see the kind of intensification as we're hoping for in downtown hundreds of people now living downtown if there was an interest in greater commercial development uh moving further past seventh street um a future council could take that up couldn't they we're not we're not creating a a, a wall around along seventh street that can't be changed Right. So, so just with, with any one of these descriptions, a future council could say times have changed and we have other needs and, and they could look at an amendment. 
And I think that I would also add that this is really trying to cast a vision for the next 20 years. And so as it's being presented right here, the vision is, is to preserve the area north of 7th Street um, and east and west of Grand and uh, Duff, you know, for the traditional neighborhoods and then try and encourage a consideration of, you know, redirection and, and work south of uh, East Lincoln Way. And furthermore, on the basis that the downtown gateway um, property between Clark and Kellogg, if that takes off, then you're actually going to be closer to that development and that densification of housing across the street south of Lincoln Way than you would be going across the tracks and going three or four blocks to the north as well, too. So I think that um, there's you know opportunities um, down there. And, and, and as I mentioned last week during our workshop and discussions with you know a couple of developers here in town, they said that the overlay, which currently exists in that area, south of Lincoln Way has really constrained them from really looking at doing rede you know, uh, redevelopment down there. And that's something we need to talk about, uh, our council needs to talk about you know, going forward. I think our, I think RDG and staff position, Tim, is that is, I think our, just kind of how the mayor walked through this, the, the hierarchy is that you have the current core, you have traditional downtown, but the real evolution is going to be towards Lincoln Way. And that's reinforcing that Lincoln Way is this corridor that's going to tie together two sides of a street. And then Kellogg's going to be a spine that can take you into this redirection area down here. And then we have other Lincoln Way corridor areas on both sides to kind of really support that, that urban evolution to the center of the city. And it, it's not a new idea. It's been in multiple plans over the last 40 years. We just haven't seen it happen. Um, but that's how this plan is really set up to work as the vision for 20 years. Yeah, I think that's helpful. I mean, uh, a lot of this, a lot of my uh, visions are speculative and sort of contingent on adding hundreds of people living downtown, uh, changing a lot of the downtown buildings to allow for greater intensification. I think if that happened, I'm just not convinced that they're going to want to go too far south. I think there'd be some interest in going a little bit further north. Um, I, I'm not committed to that uh, line um, of the demarcation. I think there's some opportunities for some change. And frankly, I think a lot of the people who live in Old Town would find having greater options um, valuable to them. Um, you know, we're, we're making decisions for people presuming that they wouldn't want to see um, more options in shopping and restaurants. Um, I'm not so sure that people who live there would have the same opinion, but I, I don't think we need to uh, focus on that today. I think we've got what we need on, in this area and we can see how things develop. Okay. Further conversation or discussion on the map or this area in particular? Okay, hearing none, entertain a motion on one of these options or an alternative to one of these options. I'd move option one with Gloria's modification. Okay. Second. All right. Moved and seconded. It was B.D. Hansen and uh, Besher. This for discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Martin? Aye. B.D. Hansen? Aye. Butcher? Aye. Martin? Aye. Junk? Aye. Boyer? Aye. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we move on to uh, item 34, East Industrial Area Utility Extension Project. I will unmute. There we go. So before you, you have the uh, East Industrial Utility Extension Project. Uh, you've seen the report of bids on this, and we've been analyzing. We have an opportunity here um, to uh, look at the, the project design again and potential um, stopping at 580th as an option. The um, bids came in uh, very high, so we're looking at all of the excess was in sanitary sewer. Um, I guess excess is the necessary word, but the high, high bid was in the sanitary sewer. All of the project 
within um, water main work was was within budget, so we can ex still extend that over to the 590th area. And so, uh, what we're looking at tonight is an option to uh, reject bids, look to see if we can rebid, um, redesign a bit. You know, if there is an option that would come forward with a um, some sort of financial stimulus package for infrastructure, um, and Steve may have an update on that. Uh, we could always take this existing set of plans and modify that to incorporate the federal requirements, such as I would anticipate Davis making wages and some of those things, and then modify that and, and go forward with some sort of stimulus project if that does come to be. So um, tonight we are, are re recommending to reject and direct us to redesign. Questions for Tracy. Tracy, I know um, the packet says rebidding in the summer of, of 2020. What What is the time frame? Do you have any idea? Yeah, so we've talked to the design consultants and they've given indication that this summer, like uh, June, July time frame, we could have the design redone and, and we could go back out for this. Okay, great. I just... I hate to see it. Amber, you're uh, cut out again. Do you mind? Uh, I can understand. What's wrong with you guys? <laughs> can you start over, Amber? I'm sorry, you get, you cut out. But, um, you know, I want to see it continue to move forward. So I was just curious whether we were talking early summer or later summer. Absolutely. And um, obviously we run a different bid environment now. I, we haven't bid anything um, since um, all of this has been going on. So we'll see where the bids come in now. Um, but hopefully we can, can do that project. We can always do similar to what we did with Welch and um, design it with some um, ad alternates. Okay. So Tracy, on the redesign, um, I presume that the, the the pump station and all the infrastructure will be laid out to support extending all the way to 590th Street. Is that correct? Correct. Overall, the design is set up so that we can we'll still keep that maximum service area and then we'll also keep it set up so that it can be extended down uh, south with the trunk line straight to the wastewater treatment plant if we you know, explode with growth out there. So what is the consultant saying in terms of revised cost estimate and what do they think that they're gonna get this down to? So council has some sort of idea what you're talking about. Are, are, they, are they saying that you can get down to Four point five million dollars from seven point one million dollars for with a redesign and reducing some of the uh, line lengths. No, that's very unlikely. Um, we're probably looking at some sort of um, need to issue some additional bonds, probably in the next uh, fiscal year. Um, well, we don't know that amount right now, but that the existing budget would enable us to at least start the construction with that issuance um, with the 21 budget. So Steve might have some insight on that too. But here, here's the reason I'm asking is that if the long-term vision is to be able to go out to 590th Street mm -hmm. to serve all the lots that are out there, I'm just trying to understand, short of just cutting off the water and sewer service, from 580th to 590th Street, what other redesign is going on to reduce costs? And if we can't reduce costs, why wasn't that included to begin with to try and keep the cost of the project down to start with? You know, we've had some conversations with the contractors and you know, really what we've been hearing is the space. The space is very tight and especially for the extra deep sewer that we're expecting on the north side with that gravity sewer. Uh, so looking at, at providing some of those more details and adding more information into the plans so that the uh, bidder knows what to expect. And, and so really it comes down to that 
at constructability and adding a lot more detail into the plans. So, as you probably have observed over the last couple of years, I'm a big fan of alternates being bid into projects. So, if a project comes in under budget, add something, if it's over budget, you can take something off and keep the project going versus going to a redesign and incurring costs. So, is it anticipated that this new design would then allow doing a completed project with some alternates to? In other words, gain down to a core, let's say serving five up to 580th Street with the option to go all the way to 590th so that if the project comes in over budget or let's say at budget or a little bit over budget and we get some money available from a stimulus package, <laughs> excuse me, that could be added in without going back and you know, doing a redesign or, or, uh, or trying to, you know, delay the project once again. I'm just curious what thoughts you have to make sure that we can keep this thing on track moving forward since we want to have this, uh, um, site, you know, ready to be, you know, built on us, um, as a, uh, I forget what the, the super site or whatever they call it. Right. And we want this project to, to move forward too. So that ad alternate gives that ability to see where bids come in with the different bid environment and more details. And, and then we can consider those um, add alternates at that time. So is this $35,000 for this redesign fee, does that include redesigning to the point that we could serve all the loss and getting the bids on, an, on a base bid plus some alternate basis is that included, or is it only included for doing part of it and cost more money to go even further yet. Yeah, so we just had a real um, brief conversation after this. We will really sit down and figure out that scope of that redesign and, and then negotiate that final contract with the design consultant. And so it may um, be, you know, slightly different than that 35,000 as we are looking at having those ad alternates. We did that similar on Welch. We did the the overall project, but then had, I think, three different ad alternates we considered. And so we were able to to do part of that with that project when we redid it. So we'll take a similar look at this one and see what we can achieve for maximum service area. Do you happen to have a map of this that you can show conveniently? If not, that's okay. But we're, it might be helpful for people watching, even for us, just to make sure we understand Thank you, Tim. I should have asked for that to be up there when we were asking these questions. Uh, let me see if I have one. I was not ready to have one with, with this. While you're pointing that up, Tracy, I'll fill the, the space a bit. Um, you know, normally when we're looking at a road project, um, we see the cost and we compare it with the service to the community. This is a bit of a different analysis for us because there, this is a different cost benefit situation because we're going to invest this money, but there is a huge upside potential that's not really reflected in what we're seeing here um, in the packet. And so $3 million, just if you look at that just in isolation, that's a lot of money, right? But given the scope of some of the projects that we're looking at that are, I, I worry that um, are being deterred from the fact that we don't yet have utilities. Um, I think it's important for council to know that um, I think it would have a deterring effect on um, someone who is looking at developing a piece of property if we don't have our part in place with the water and sewer. And so um, this is actually one of the harder um, topics that I've seen in a, in a city council packet. 
just because we're asked to balance these different things. And, and I don't know if we'll have an opportunity to hear from um, uh, if, if Dan Cohane or Chuck Winkleblack will be available to speak to this, but if there was a way for us to at least get something out to 580th, um, I, I think that would speak volumes about the city's commitment. Um, I just want to just remind council, this is just sort of a different creature. And there's a lot of, um, there's one more piece of this with the, the virus thing going on, the pandemic, it's really important that we don't take our foot off the gas of this project because the greater community needs us to continue um, seeing this. If there's a major drawdown in state or federal funding, um, that would be very, very harmful for the community. And so our ability to provide services would be definitely hampered. And so um, seeing us increase our private sector tax base for the greater good is really important right now. So uh, Tracy, you've got the map. I, burned up some some dead time thank you we appreciate that so this is a bit outdated um so this lift station that we had shown here is actually down here set up for 580 to extend further south um that's what we were able to negotiate and then that um water storage tank would go on that same site down here so we have gravity sewer um on the the north side it comes down to this lift station that pumps it back up with the um, force main coming back down to our um, siphon here at the East Lincoln Way in the river area. So this is the area that we're talking about, east of, primarily east of um, I-35 for the service area and then the, um, with the lift station for that interim flow to go back to tie into that existing sanitary sewer trunk main that we have that goes north-south um, right through, this is Menards, just north of Highway 30, just to give everybody a reference. And so uh, we have a trunk main that goes through there, and then that that ties into that, that major trunk main that takes the entire flow down to the wastewater treatment plant. But Tracy, so my here's my reason for, I was trying to tease out some um, information regarding you know alternates and design. So you're going to redesign. You still have to have the the force main pump station, right? Correct. So, so is it, would it be correct that really from 580th going east, it's primarily just an extension of water and sewer lines? It is. It's the gravity uh, sewer and then the water main to serve this area here between. Um, so, so, so here's my, here's my suggestion and just for council's consideration is, if you're saying that we're going to have to, that the council and the city have to issue potentially more than the bonds that currently were issued, more than 5.3 million, and let's just, I'm just, I'm just being hypothetical. Let's just say it's an additional million dollars in order to get this put in. And for another 350 or $400,000, we can go all the way over and pick up the 590th street and get all these sites taken care of. It'd be nice to have that bid information at the time of the award, because instead of spending $1 million for sake of discussion on bonds, maybe you spend $1.5 million more on bonds and you get the whole thing done essentially. Because we're not building additional, I'm not saying we're not building additional pump stations, we're not building other things to get out from 580 to 590. It's just basically lines buried in the dirt, right? Correct. It's just that deep sanitary sewer there on the north side, and uh, that would flow then to 580th and then south. Correct. So, are you still going to be deep, or if you're going, if you got a uh, lift station, aren't you going to? Can't you go shallower because you're going to go ahead and uh, pump it and lift it anyway? We are setting this up so that it can all gravity flow then south through the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, that oh. So you're um, saying that, you're thinking like, a lot of this so deep and then all it so we're both setting it up for this interim um, flow towards the west and then also with wanting to have it as deep as we can for the maximum service area as people grade the sites. So then you would run a new sanitary sewer line 
south on like 580th to go down to the wastewater treatment plant. Correct. If the industrial flow is so higher than what our existing sanitary trunk main can take there along the river, then we would need to have a separate trunk main that came on the east side of I-35. And is that, plant. was that conceived of back a few years ago? Yes, that has been the plan. Um, that's why when some of the sites, the, um, talking to the you know, Ames Economic Development, were really considering the flows that uh, potential developments are coming forward with um, as far as that existing capacity and the capacity of our wastewater treatment plant. Other questions for uh, Tracy? All right, so there's two items on the agenda. Um, one is motion rejecting all bids and the other one is motion directing staff to contract with Stanley to create revised plans and specifications. Is there a interest in, a, in making a motion tonight? Is there public input for this? Uh, given the fact that we were rejecting all bids, I wasn't anticipating that. But. Well, is, is this something that we'll be able to get, you think, in the ground this year? I would think we would be able to bid and a late fall start, depending on the contractor's schedule and availability. What, and another question for Tracy, what's the estimating cost savings that you're looking at trying to accomplish through this redesign? I don't know that we've fully established that yet. We've been having conversations with Steve, maybe he wants to chime in. Just as much as possible. We think this is higher than we budget and if there's an opportunity to reduce the cost, I don't think we're gonna get it down to 5.3 million Right. I think by rebidding it and uh, hopefully redesigning it, maybe going to 580th, will reduce that uh, cost. How much you don't know yet. Uh, we could do the greatest thing we can in estimates and the bidding environment might be worse. You know what I mean? We could not, we could not do much of a, we could rebid this project tomorrow and maybe there'll be people hungry. Who knows what's going to happen in this environment? So understand. I don't think you're objecting to rejecting the bids. I think what you're asking us, maybe we could bid it so we bid it kind of both ways. You can either think of it as a deduct or a, an add, so we could get a cost, a rebidding going all the way to 590th and maybe to the 580th and see what, what the difference is. The consultant would have to tell us which way they want to do it. And that way you could compare and make a final decision on the rebid. Whether it's, if it's not that much more, you go all the way to 590th. What I was also trying to explore, Steve, was if the consultant believes we're going to save three hundred thousand dollars by doing a redesign to go out to you know and, and including going out to 590th street and six hundred thousand dollars total for the whole project you know does that make sense if you're you'd have to just bite the bullet and just go forward with it as it is and just and move forward or if it's much more significant in terms of the, the cost savings then i think it's worth Exploring, I was just trying to see if, if there had been discussion on that in terms of what kind of magnitude um, of the cost savings. And apparently, the answer is no. So that's that well. Answer. Right now, with the current bid, we've estimated that we would save six hundred fifty thousand to seven hundred fifty thousand, depending on we, we needed to fine tune that, but just from stopping at five hundred and eighty. That's just the linear footage, like you were saying there. Right. Not whether we can, a better bidding environment or um, tightening up the specs. Um, so a saving around that amount, what would we be looking at for the sewer rate increase potentially? Well, your $3 million is estimated could be about 2.6% increase in sewer rates. So take a third of each, you know, if it's, Two million, a third of the, a third off of that. It was one and a half million. You take off half of that. 
a 1.3% increase. These are just estimates again. So, Mayor, if, if just because of the significance of this um, this decision, uh, would would you entertain having brief comments from either Dan or Chuck? If I don't know if they're available, um, I just I, th I think it's important that we understand uh, efforts to try to recruit businesses and. I have no idea how what our decision tonight, how it's going to be communicated uh, to Alliant Energy, our partner in this, um, and to other people who are, are looking at this as a development site. Right. Brian, is there anyone that has expressed interest in uh, offering comment? Yes, Mayor. I will unmute uh, Dan Culhane. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Dan Colhane here, 3115 Aspen Road, and with the Ames Economic Development Commission. I trust you can hear me? Yes, thank you, Dan. Okay, very good. I'll be brief. Uh, what my board chairman, Chuck Winkleblack, who's also on the call, and I outlined in our letter that was submitted to you last week, uh, it, I think articulates it pretty well. Um, we are incredibly interested in keeping this moving along, given the, the five-year options on the property that sit in Prairie View Industrial Center. There's a little over 700 acres that are under option out there right now. Those options have been underwritten by Alliant Energy. At the same time, the site certification process, which uh, has an expiration date, uh, also has been underwritten by Alliant Energy. And so we're in the third year of, of five-year options on those properties. We'd really like to see something uh, get moving uh, soon, as soon as possible. I know it's easy to poke holes and things like this and suggest that, well, nothing's happened. It's been three years, nothing's happened. Well, in large part, that's because we don't have the, the proper infrastructure to deploy, uh, to, to put an industry out there. Um, uh, re regardless of uh, what you may or may not hear, we see incredible activity on this property given the rail that sits on the north side of Prairie View Industrial Center. There's a 309 acre parcel that sits on the north side of Lincoln Way that is incredibly valuable it just needs sewer and water. And so uh, we took it, we took in another project this set this Saturday morning from the state. They sent us an email. Uh, we're responding with that site. And we continue to talk to people about uh, the, the, the when, when the when the property will be fully served. And we continue to kick that can down the road. Uh, we know we're partners in this together. Our Alliant Energy has been patient, um, but they're also interested in seeing this move along as well. And I'll stop there. And if, if Chuck has anything additional to say, I'll let him raise his hand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor of uh, Unmuted, Chuck Winkleblack. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Chuck Winkleblack, 105 South 16th Street. Um, I think uh, Dan pretty well summed it up. It, this isn't really the chicken or the egg thing. Um, we have to have water and sewer out there before uh, anything can happen. When people are looking at that uh, area, and I think David and other of those that have, that have been to the AADC board meetings have heard Dan's uh, updates and the people that are looking, but nobody's gonna make a sizable commitment if it's on uh, the hope and dream that utilities will be there. It all starts with the utilities, and that's why even if we have to scale back, we're we're not uh, hopeful it won't have to scale back. But we have to get something out there to break the seal, and then I think you'll be amazed at how many projects uh, can go forward and are still continuing to look at Ames. But we've got to get water and sewer out there because when you tell people it's a couple years away, their horizon is not necessarily going to wait that long and although some of the buildings that we're talking about will likely take a year to build they have to know that the basic infrastructure is is there and that's what's critical is to even if the utilities can't be done this fall have the project underway sends a strong message to those looking at the community in prairie view park that uh, utilities will be there when their projects are complete and ready to open thank you for your time Thank you. Anybody else, uh, Brian? 
Mayor, I do not see anyone else with their hand raised. Okay. We will close public input. Okay, I need a motion regarding rejecting all bids. I'd move alternative one. I would second, and, and that includes both parts A and B, rejecting bids and directing staff to contract with Stanley. Yes. I second that. Okay, discussion? Um, I remember that this was one of the first things I think that we talked about when I was first on council in 2016. And um, at the time, I was not supportive of going all the way to 590th. Um, and, you know, council decided that was the way we want to go. But I, I still think it's okay to scale back here. Um, it's a huge amount of land. So even if we go, you know, if we have to scale back the distance, I think we still open up a lot of land. And I understand the efficiency, right, of doing it all at once rather than waiting. So I'm, I get that point. But I think it's still valuable to get it out there. I mean, I totally understand Chuck's point about having it available before anybody is going to make an investment. So I do understand that, but I also, I'm comfortable if we have to scale it back a little because it, it always did seem like a really, really large chunk that we were making available all at once to me. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions, comments? All right. Those in favor of the motion say aye. aye. Hi. 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 Those opposed or abstaining? Motion carried. Tracy, the only question I have is, are you going to, will there be an alternate included to try and get that water or that water and sewer all the way out to 590 so you have that actual hard data or not? Yes, we can do that. Well, I may should say, maybe you should find out what kind of cost. I mean, if, if Stanley's going to say it's going to be I mean, the council action form showed about, you know, an estimate of ninety of thirty-five thousand dollars. I mean, I, I don't know what council's opinion is, but it just seems to have that data and in, in, you know, and actually hard numbers. If it's, just, if it's just basically showing the sewer line going out there, it shouldn't seem to be that much more expensive to get it done. But that's my opinion. My goal is make it as simple as possible. So that sounds good. All right. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Um, next item is request from Ames Main Street Farmers Market to reconsider suspension of the market. Steve? Uh, I think uh, Brian's going to handle that one. Okay. Yes, thank you, Steve and Mayor and Council Members. Uh, what you have before you is a request to reconsider staff's action to suspend uh, all events taking place on city property, including streets and sidewalks. Um, that action was taken about a month and a half ago and extends through May 15th. Uh, the Ames Farmers Market uh, would like uh, staff or would like the city to reconsider that and allow the market to operate beginning May 9th, which is their scheduled opening day. Um, the governor has revised her proclamation uh, such that uh, it is permissible to have a farmers market as long as it meets certain um, requirements. Um, however, the city is empowered to decide whether um, we would like to allow the use of city property for that purpose. Um, so the council is being asked uh, whether they would like to um, allow the market to proceed on May 9th. Uh, if you would like to do that, I think the question then becomes uh, what your expectations are for uh, additional safety precautions, if any, um, uh, or if you would like to uphold uh, the staff action to continue the suspension of events through May 15th. Uh, we do plan to bring to you at the first city council meeting in May, I think that's May, is that the 12th? Uh, yes, May 12th. We do plan to bring to you a report um, uh, discussing how we will proceed beyond uh, May 15th uh, in light of the COVID-19 situation. Um, so 
for example, would you like to extend the um, suspensions of events and activities, uh, or would you like to begin opening up? Uh, what are the time frames? What are the um, uh, what are the processes you'd like to use to evaluate that? So we will bring you more discussion about that as a comprehensive topic in May, uh, but in order to uh, take action on the farmer's market request in a timely manner, um, this is the, the last possible city council meeting before the first uh, farmer's market. Um, so I'll gladly answer any questions that you might have. Um, and I believe there are some representatives of the market um, who are uh, listening in who may be able to answer questions or speak on this item. Okay, hey, council? Discussion? So do we have a sense of how other um, communities are responding uh, to opportunities for their farmer's market? I don't have information about other communities. Um, I have seen uh, some discussion among other city managers about um, how they're responding to the uh, loosening of restrictions on um, business activities. And, and for example, whether they would open city halls back up and things of that nature. Um, and, and the response has been mixed, but I'd say that um, the folks that I've seen chime in are indicating they're going to be pretty cautious about reopening their own city facilities. Uh, but I have not uh, seen any information about other farmers markets specifically. This is, a, this is an interesting one. I'm torn about it. I mean, it's part of it, you know, for one, I think it's a really important time to support local farmers and local agriculture. Um, and so for that reason, you know, I'm, you know, part of me is very supportive. It's also, it doesn't feel much different to me than, um, than people walking around a Target or a Walmart, except it's outside, which is better than people walking around a, a Target or a Walmart where we're, where they're currently allowed to be. So, um, so I guess I, I don't object to it on those grounds. We'd want to be very careful. I mean, I think we definitely want to take extra precautions. You know, I like the ideas that I think would be obvious, you know, that were stated would be no entertainment, no seating. Um, maybe we could extend the area of it farther, you know, more blocks to spread out the vendors perhaps, or uh, I don't know, but that's kind of my initial take. I guess so. It's, Go ahead, Amber. Okay. Um, it's more about the message that we're sending to the community. And I know, obviously, Polk County is, is not able to open up yet, but I know the Des Moines Farmers Market is going strictly virtual for the first three weeks, and then they're going to continually kind of reevaluate what they're doing. And it seems like when the Ames Farmers Market posted the message on Facebook that they were going virtual, that was in response to a lot of the community concerns. And I mean, there were a ton of messages on there really commending them for that decision. And I don't think it was made clear that there was an intention to do an in-person event while still doing a virtual event. And so I just feel like the message that we're getting from community members is that they want us to be cautious. And I worry that we're sending a different message when we allow um, special events, even though I do agree with Bronwyn that this one is a little bit different than, you know, the, the Velo event that we discussed earlier. So I was actually thinking about how we could allow this uh, until we voted on that event earlier, which led me to believe that if we're gonna be really concerned about bringing 500 people to downtown Ames in the middle of June, why wouldn't we be even more concerned about having a farmer's market on public property on May 9th? And so I think I am now changing where I stood on this. One of my biggest concerns is that I do not doubt that the farmer's market will do everything possible to 
provide for social distancing and, and all the other recommendations, but I don't see a lot of indication that citizens have been complying particularly well in shopping experiences. And so I worry that it would be very difficult for us to enforce anything. I, I mean, the, the thought of sending the Ames police in to enforce social distancing at the farmer's market is not one that I want to entertain. And yet I, I don't know how you enforce um, healthy practices. I don't know that it would have to be the police. I mean, that is a challenge for sure, but that, <clears> would be, <throat> that could be the purview of the farmer's market um, organization, or, you know, the main street organization, right? So a business right now, they have a business would have the right to refuse someone's service or to kick someone out, say, and I would see that the same. So if you had um, someone who was, you know, flaunting social distancing guidelines or something like that. But again, you'd have to have staff available to do that. So that's a, that is a, an issue, I think, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be the police. I don't think. Well, would that be allowed? I mean, it's public property, so I don't know what the rights of the farmer's market are to enforce on public property. Oh, I'm sure, I'm guessing that you could, they could kick someone out for being disruptive or unruly currently, right? I would think. Yeah, Even yeah. I think yeah. We, we have uh, groups that sponsor events and they're in charge of controlling the, the crowds. If they try to kick somebody out, I guess if someone refused, at that point, they might have to call the police. Right. But they, they're usually responsible for their own crowd control for whatever reasons. But, I mean, this isn't, strictly speaking, crowd control. It's, it's, it's not even a mandate that people be wearing masks, right? right. So um, I, I don't know what grounds you have. We could do that, though. We could mandate that people wear masks. We could uh, we could make that a condition, and make, and make Main Street enforce it. I mean, if we wanted, that's just hypothetical. What, what we could say? What do we lose by saying we're going to be considering this on May twelfth? Oh, yeah. along with a set of of other openings for city property, and I mean, it's one week of the farmers market. Yeah, I think that's fine. Delaying till the twelfth, that's not bad. I'm not opposed to that necessarily. David, did you have something to say? Or? Yeah, um, I, this is an interesting, interesting discussion. And I think things are a little different for this than the other events that we're considering. First, obviously, the governor has carved out farmers markets specifically right now. And um, in, in terms of enforcement, you know, this is a, I think if you take the farmers market and you remove the people who are just coming to hang out with other people, and to buy things from food trucks and that sort of thing, you're going to have a smaller crowd of people. And it's, um, it's a repeated event. And so if, if something, if it's just not going well after the first week or the second week, then we can revisit and say, well, it just really doesn't seem to be working. And I don't think that we have lost everything by having a week where, a, you know, some people got too close to each other. So I think the risks are fairly low there. I think also, I'm, I'm trying to think of this in terms of what policy have we actually identified as a council for managing this? And we haven't voted directly on much, but I think we did agree in principle on the, the city manager's um, policy for the city facilities, which included first, taking measures to make sure that our medical systems don't become overwhelmed. And second, protecting city employees for being exposed so that we can maintain the, the critical services. When I think about what's happening at the farmer's market, if we look at all of the measures that um, have already been proposed here, and we, we can even add some more, but if we look at all those measures, do we really expect that the event that will happen will violate those two goals? When I think of it that way, I, I just don't think that it will. I think it's really worth a, a try. And I, you know, I, I think it's important for people who have been growing food in their property to have a way to sell it. This is good food that they sell. And I don't really appreciate the difference in safety between an outdoor event being carefully managed like this and a grocery store. 
So um, I'm, I'm really leaning towards trying to figure out how we do this. I'd say that we should make it clear that we don't want to see food trucks there. We don't want to see um, any food prepared on site, whether it's hot or cold. You know, but people, food that people are bringing to sell from their tents, I think that that's actually a good thing. So, David, one of the questions I'd have for you would be if if we're looking at the city's plan and the, the strategic um, phasing in of different activities and then the plan to phase out again, why would we jump that plan by a week if we're saying, you know, that everything's been carefully thought out? I think this is a great test case because it is not going to be an overwhelmingly large event with the, I think, with the limited vendors and the careful precautions. And I think, you know, a lot of people simply won't go because they, they don't, you know, they just don't want to go out. So I think the numbers will be lower. And since it's repeated, this is, actually gives us a, a head start to see how it goes with an event like this. It gives us some data before we even have that discussion on May 12th to see, you know, we can take that into account when we think of what are people in Ames seem to be willing to do at this point. And when we open things up, how risky does that actually seem to be? Tim or uh, Rachel, any input? Yeah, um, I would be more in favor of kind of the cautious, consistent approach and um, hopefully discussing this at our May 12th meeting in conjunction with all the other events. I also, if there's someone from Ames Main Street who could talk a little bit about the precautions that they're planning for a farmer's market and maybe even if they've thought about some of the things that would be above the governor's recommendation like masks or only allowing a certain number of people, that would certainly help make this decision. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, pause. I, um, I'm still with Braun when I feel very torn on this. Um, so in general, we think about equal protection. That, that basically means we treat like parties the same. And so it's hard for me to go into a Walmart or Target and see a certain type of behavior and say that we, we couldn't allow that with the farmer's market. But I think Amber makes a very good point. And I want to, so we, we want to be sensitive to the farmers, but we also want to think about our messaging. So I would really only be supportive of this if there's a way in which um, we could really sort of tease out some of the, the concerns that Amber has, because I think they're really good, and I share them, that there's a public health aspect. And guys, in a month or two, we'll, I hope we'll be on the other side of this. This is a short-term deal. So I don't want to overthink it, but I don't want to underthink it either. But I, I feel this tension with this situation. I don't think this is an easy question. All right, let's, uh, I heard some in interest in getting some feedback from Farmer's Market. I think that uh, hello, Jean may be uh, available. Has anyone raised their hand? Brian, besides, or anyone in I indicated interest in addressing council on this one? Yes. Uh, 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 hello, Jean is, uh, is on Zoom here. Just a moment. Okay, hello, Jean. Hello, Jean, are you there? Hello, Jean? She fell off the list. Uh, well, she had her hand up and... Uh, Check off. Um, not sure what to say. She was there. Yeah, she's um, she's approved to speak. Is there anyone else that Brian you could call on, and then we could try to get her back on the line? Or she's the only only one to speak on this. Brian, she's the only one that I see, and um, she should be able to speak, as far as I can I can tell. There, you did exactly what I did. I I don't know why she's not able to speak. Well, to Brian's point, she's uh, not showing up on the uh, participant list. Yeah. Anymore, so she has an older version of Zoom, so it said to move her to panelist. So she should be on the panelist list. 
Okay. Uh, there's no video, but it shows no audio either under panelists. Audio, period. Mm-hmm. Well, Gene, can you use Morse code? Well, it appears that she, now he does not, she does, video's not on, but she doesn't have a microphone even shown as being muted, Brian. Let's not be able to talk. I don't think so. All right, let's let's keep on going. Anyone else besides Eugene? That raise your hand, Brian. Uh, yes, Dan Cohane. All right. Dan. Uh, Dan Cohane here. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think what Eugene was probably going to talk about was the precautions she was going to take. Uh, she's completely sensitive to uh, the situation at hand. And I know she's been uh, mapping this out for several weeks in anticipation of if and when things opened up. And so I, I can assure you that LaJean's very judicious and she'd work with the city however you wanted her to do, to do so. There is a phone number now with its hand raised. Yes. Um. Yes, hello. 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 This is Logene. Hello. Hello, yes. Logene. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, sorry, my Zoom first time, wasn't first time working. <laughs> um, so, as far as answering your questions, yes, we did kind of put out that the virtual market is starting, and we do hope that that will um, many people will use that and alleviate the problem that uh, people will be on the street to join our on this market on the street. However, we don't feel like um, the online market will be able to, it won't be open to all the customers. You know, there will be some that do not have the opportunity to order online. And um, with the SNAP and the Double Up Food program that we're starting, um, many of those customers may not be able to purchase their produce with us on an online version of our market. So that is kind of why we are wanting to um, have the on-site market on the main street. Uh, um, Rachel, you had some questions you wanted to have answered. Can you pose those questions to Lojean, please? Yeah, um, I just was wondering what were some of the types of things that you would be doing at the in-person farmer's market to encourage social distancing and hygiene? Okay, well, we will be um, asking everybody, you know, we will have a lot of signage up. We will have um, the X's on the street to mark out the social distancing. Um, we won't have food samplings. We'll make sure that um, our vendors are using gloves and masks. Um, no chairs and tables will be set up. All our vendors that are bringing home goods, um, home baked goods to the market, they will all be pre-wrapped and packaged before they are brought to the market. Um, let me see where it's, you know, a lot of those, all of the, um, outline guidelines that the state recommended, we have all put in place or have um, proposed to put in place. So we would follow all of their criteria right now. Uh, reduce the handling of money and things like that. Do you feel like you would be able to enforce if there were violations of um, social distance distancing so that's one question and then would you consider mandating masks from visitors as well as vendors and would you have the capacity to enforce that we would certainly try let's put it that way um you know we don't have a large staff we would certainly hope that they would follow our recommendations that we would post on signage as they came in and we will post to social media but um 
it, you know, it will be a hard thing to enforce, maybe. Is, is postponing the opening potentially by a week till this council meets on the 12th to discuss some of these policies regarding special events? Would that be a significant hindrance to the season? No, we could live with that. I would ask that we could still leave um, our street open or close for the market um, because our online market, the governor has written that our online ordering should be available where our market is set up during the designated market hours. So we would need the street that we have asked for to be closed so we can provide our online market, which possibly could start on May 9th. So people could drive up and pick up items they ordered? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right now, our plan is to have half of our market be the online market with the fewer market vendors and the other half be for our pickup line for the online market. Well, Jean, we got, the council got an email um, from someone indicating that their observation um, is that uh, it's very hard to maintain social distancing, especially at the beginning of the day when people are trying to get the pick of the litter, so to speak. Um, they're all, you know, get clamoring close to the table, and uh, I think that I think you understand that all of council. You know, I think there's arms market is an integral part of our community, and we are fully supportive of that. But we also right. have an obligation to protect, you know, our the public and try and you know provide. You know, uh, guidelines or following the guidelines the governor has set up. So I think, um, how, how could, what suggestions do you have on that to try and avoid just the first half an hour of chaos of people just not wanting to be six foot in part? I mean, you, you go to people, I've heard reports people go into, you know, retail box stores and people are just not paying attention to social distancing whatsoever. And I think, yeah, on public property, that's the concern is what's the, What's the message that's being communicated and, and being tolerated? Yes, I read that in the Tribune. Um, I don't believe they've been to the Ames um, Farmer's Market, downtown Farmer's Market here. Um, we do not have that problem. When opening bell rings, it's very quiet. Our market usually is slow and uh, to start. But um, I understand the problem. We would certainly do our best to enforce with what staff we have there that people social distance. We possibly would have to maybe go to where we only allow so many visitors into the market at a time. You know, keep account like some of the stores are doing. That would be a possibility. But I believe it's just going to be one of those things where we're going to have to start and see what happens and make adjustments along the way. Okay. Any other questions for Logene? Just a word of thanks. We wouldn't have a farmer's market if it wasn't for Logene. And and he needs to know that. And you're you're being extremely flexible and willingness. You're willing to think outside the box. And we really appreciate your uh, your attitude of being flexible. Um, I'm I'm just concerned that we we vote to open this. The Ames Tribune headline is going to be farmers market open and. Amber's point then we're we're trying to unpack for the community so how we message this is going to be really important thank you I do understand that and I do our priority is to keep everybody safe vendors and customers so I appreciate any guidance you can give us and we will look forward to possibly that day where we can open thank you Lojean okay mm -hmm. well, You're welcome. Welcome. Well, they, uh, Brian, is there anybody else that wants to give input? Uh, raise your hand. I'm sorry, before I close the public input. Uh, no, Mayor, I don't see anyone else, but I did want to make a, just a brief observation. 
you know, one of the things that you might consider is additional restrictions or conditions. And um, I just want to mention that the way the market is structured right now, you can freely walk between the market and the sidewalk that runs alongside and go to the businesses. And with a setup like that, it makes it a little bit more difficult to control who is following additional restrictions if we implement those. So for example, if you wanted to require that every participant in the market wears a mask, it's tough to manage that if people walking along the sidewalk who aren't participating in the market aren't wearing masks. So if you were to implement some additional restrictions, uh, we might want to look at, at also requiring some kind of a, an enclosure or way to separate the market participants from people on the sidewalk who just want to get down the sidewalk. Um, we, we don't quite have that in, uh, issue in other events where we've got like a fenced in beer garden, for example, but I think in, a, in the farmer's market where you can freely walk between those areas, that might be something to consider if you want to look at additional restrictions. It'd be very difficult to limit the number of people who come in because people go to the stores, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you even know who's going to the market and who's going to stop in a store instead? Okay, there's a council action form has uh, some alternatives. Is there a motion on the uh, request? If I could start, I, um, I was going to move alternative three, which was going to be to approve it to, to begin as requested. I don't think that's really going to fly tonight based on what I've heard from the rest of the council. Um, but I seriously hope that we can make this work. I'm also concerned about the messaging. And I, and I, I agree that if, if, we, if people just hear the message that it's open, come on downtown party, that'd be bad. That's not what we're intending. Um, but I, I also worry about the messaging that sort of suggests that that we think it's more dangerous to be out, you know, on, on, a, on Main Street in, in the sun with people who have grown their own food and are, you know, are trying, trying to um, provide it to people. I don't like that messaging either. So waiting till May 12th, not a huge deal. We heard that from Logeen. I, I think it probably matters to the to the providers, but um, uh, I think um, what it is it is one week. I really hope that we can figure out how to make this work at that time. I'll leave it to someone else to make a motion. Um, I would move alternative one. Second. Moved by uh, John. Second by Corey. Alternative one being. Which is uh, do not grant the request to hold it on late May 9th, but to uh, go ahead. You you read it, Amber. Uh, Rachel. You made the motion. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, do not grant the request to hold Main Street Farmers Market on May 9th and address the status of the event at the same time. City Council considers how to proceed with other events on city property. Is there a? Go wait. ahead. No, I'll wait till there's a second. Oh, I second. There was one. Oh. Um. Is there any way to allow them to continue the virtual market only, or is that yes. a second motion? I was going to ask about that too. Mm -hmm. What if we have a second motion on that? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Everyone understand the motion? Yeah. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion carried five to one. Martin uh, was nay. All right. So the second motion, uh, so Brown or Amber? So Brian is, I, I guess I'm not sure exactly what you need from us, just an, uh, an approval to, for some street closures to allow for a drive up type pickup option. Uh, yeah, I just think a motion um, exempting a pickup option for a farmer's market from the closures of events on city property. Okay, that's my motion. Second. <laughs> All right, move a second. Everyone understand, Nicely the, done. understand the motion? Yes, and but does that also include all of the other things that would go along with having the farmer's market sand stalls? So road closure, parking waiver, all of that stuff? That's what they're asking for. Yeah. I know, but is that I, I don't know if that's the motion. Ryan, is that implicit in your motion? 
Or yeah, not in your motion. <laughs> Excuse me. In Amber's motion. That was my assumption. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm seeing. I'm assuming they need the same amount of space. Right. Virtual. The same uh, uh, booths will be set up, I guess. So they probably need the same area. Well, couldn't staff work with farmers market and get that determined in terms of it? They understand what the policy is, where we want to go with that, or not? If you give well, us, the yeah, I, I, you have already approved those things um, months ago as part of the farmers market approval. It's just allowing this first Saturday of farmers market to be conducted only as a draw as a pickup uh, type option, not with um, people walking through the market area. Right. They're asking the same streets, same waiver. Right. Yeah. Yep. It's okay. So that's implicit in the motion then. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. Well, just make it part of the motion. So, yeah. It, it helps <laughs> with the motions. Oh, it is a. Uh, your motion. So Steve's going to make a motion now, too. <laughs> <laughs> Good for the record. So my motion would include granting their requests for closure of parking spaces and waiver of fees. You second that, uh, Rachel? Yeah, second. Okay. Everyone clear in that motion now? I'm Brian, I mean, I'm Amherst. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Okay, let's take a uh, quick five minute bio break please we will reconvene at uh 90 11. right now how to do that thanks mayor you can just stay logged in steve <laughs> Thank you. 
2019-2020 funding contracts impacted by COVID-19. Steve, and is Deb helping you out with this one or? You're muted, Steve. Yep. Okay, I'll go ahead and start. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we've provided you with information about uh, the fiscal year 20 contracts that we have with asset agencies. And um, on the, on the uh, Council Action Form, we've outlined those entities uh, that still have funds remaining within their contracts until June 30th. Um, and that is uh, a total of 18 agencies um, with uh, 37 services uh, that have um, ending fund balances. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the way services are delivered uh, for these agencies. And to get a better handle on, on what that delivery looked like, the asset administrative staff uh, put together a status of services survey and sent that out to the agencies to respond to. And we had 27 agencies out of the 29 uh, respond. And questions that they responded to included um, the laying off of staff due to COVID-19, um, whether or not the agency has continued with no modifications to their services, whether they've modified their services or they've had to stop services altogether. Um, we asked if they anticipated in, uh, re reinstating services and when that might be. And as you can guess, um, there are just a lot of unknowns um, when they can reinstate services to the degree they were providing them prior to COVID-19. We asked about revenue sources and anticipated amounts that the agencies have lost. Uh, we asked if agencies had reserves to help cover some of these expenses. And then we also had asked agencies if they applied for any of the federal funding available through the CARES Act. Um, so we got um, varying degrees of responses on all of those questions. Um, the asset administrative staff, we collectively reviewed um, the responses and agreed that funding should continue to be available uh, for those services that are being provided in the same manner um, with no modifications. So. Um, the same way that they were provided prior to COVID-19. Um, that services modified um, still meet the unit of service definition that's outlined in the asset reference manual. And then we also are recommending that services that have stopped should not be funded unless they're reinstated and units are provided prior to June 30th of 2020. Um, Again, agencies are, are having to figure out different ways of um, adjusting their services and serving their clientele um, due to social distancing and other recommended health and safety practices. Um, we think that uh, the majority of the services that have been modified um, may be able to continue to draw down their funding. But I would like to point out that there are agencies um, within the, uh, the table on the first page of the Council Action Form um, that um, have funds available uh, to be able to move to other service areas if they deem that that um, other service area is uh, in need of more funding or has a high need of demand. Um, and those agencies are ChildServe, Good Neighbor, Heartland Senior Services, and MICA. Um, the, the agencies who have applied for the funding through the CARES Act um, are in different states of, of receiving information back. Some have uh, received funds already through the payroll protection plan, while others uh, had applied. They were waiting for their lending institutions to get their applications pushed through. They missed that first um, go around of funding, but uh, they still have applications submitted for the funding that was released, I believe, late last week, maybe, maybe early this week. Um, most of them seem to be uh, eligible to apply for the payroll protection plan, uh, but there's also um, another loan called the um, Economic Injury uh, Disaster Loan um, that a few have applied for. And then there are agencies that receive federal dollars through um, the Emergency Solutions Grant, Transit Funding, and Community Services Block Grant, and they're waiting to hear how those dollars will be disseminated um, uh, to to their respective services. 
Um, so our, our um, alternatives um, are outlined and we are recommending um, that uh, staff be directed to issue reimbursement based on contracted units of service actually provided through June 30th. If there are remaining funds, we should allow agencies to request a reallocation of funding to a service area that demonstrates a need for additional funds and that services can be provided through June 30th. If funds still remain as of June 30th, then allow agencies to carry uh, fiscal year 20 funds over into fiscal year 21 if they're not drawn down due to COVID-19. Uh, and the city council should authorize staff to review and approve reallocations and or rollover requests. I'm, I'll take a pause there and, and address any questions or comments you may have. Deb, are any of those four age, or sorry, 14 agencies that are no longer offering services likely to not return to business as usual after this is over? What do you mean? I think that have stopped offering services. Do you mean number two? Do you mean permanently or just in this fiscal year? Uh, well, either. Um, I I don't know. I don't know which of the agencies these are, and so I don't really have any way to gauge whether there yeah. may be some of them who would not be offering services again in the future. Right. We don't have any indication at this point that an agency would stop, would, would close its doors or stop providing a service altogether. Um, the agencies that have uh, stopped services, a couple of the daycare agencies um, were um, decided to close, even though that wasn't necessarily covered under the governor's proclamation. Um, their respective boards of directors decided to, to close for safety reasons. Um, one of the agencies is looking at possibly reopening after Memorial Day weekend. Um, now that I think we know where the school closures are at, I think that does help some of those agencies with, um, with some additional planning and, and how they can um, open up and, and be able to serve um, children and, and um, families. Um, Heartland Senior Services um, closed their um, adult day service and they're not doing their activities uh, because of social distancing and, and other health care um, issues. Um, we've got um, um, transportation through um, RSVP um, decided to stop services at this point in time, again, because of the, the close proximity um, of, of transporting individuals. So it's those type of services, but again, no indication um, that service, those services would stop altogether um, as a result of the, the pandemic. I mean, I think option one is good. I, I could have gone with one or two, honestly. I, I think it's important that we allow for flexibility right now. Um, I just know where I'm at. It's, it's an evolving situation on a daily basis. And it's really important for um, funders to, to be flexible and work with the organization so that they continue to alter their services if they need to or keep their doors open um, while we're in this temporary closure period as well. I agree with that, and and I think um, one strikes a pretty good balance. Um, I I want I want to think that if if these agencies have unforeseen needs now that they've had to change their service offerings, and that's that, that's something that maybe we should be able to consider and, and and act upon. I think I think it's going too far for us to to just say that um, we're going to give give away all this money without anyone asking for it. I think that's that would be a little weird. Um, but, but I do think that I, I would, I, I guess I would like to sort of informally say that just like ERP has done, they realized they had a severe need. And so they came to us and said, can you be a participant in, in helping solve this? I hope the other asset agencies will, will, um, will, will keep us in mind, but otherwise the framework of alternative one sounds pretty good to me. I'd go ahead and move alternative one. Second. Okay. Um, moving to second by Query and uh, Betcher. Um, Brian, is there anybody who has raised their hand wanting to give any public input on this before we move on? 
Mayor, I do not see anyone with their hand raised. Okay. Yeah, I had one question. Um, so I, I just was assuming that you've had some interaction um, with Jean Cressy on this. I mean, do you feel like there's been some coordination with her? Yes, yes. Um, coordination involving United Way and Story County. Um, we, we all three looked at the responses and talked about where um, each funder was at within the, their respective contracts. Um, some agencies, as you know, draw down funds more quickly than others throughout the, the fiscal year. So, so there is that kind of that checks and balances that we do um, naturally um, with, with the county and United Way in the city. Um, and uh, United Way will be um, taking this to their allocations board on April 30th. And um, the County Board of Supervisors will address the request, um, I believe on May 1st, maybe that's changed, but that was when Sandra King thought she might have it before the Board of Supervisors. As a, as a side note, this is really one of the benefits of our asset program. Um, for those communities who don't have anything like we have, the challenge of making sure that their social service agencies are healthy during this time has got to be a much more difficult situation. And so obviously one of the unintended benefits of our asset structure is being able to handle a crisis like this in a, in a more organized and thoughtful manner. So thanks for your work on this. Everyone understand the motion? Those in favor of say aye. 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 Opposed or abstaining? Motion carried. Resolution. Thank you, Thank you. All right, moving on to item 35B, request from ERP for additional funding due to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. All right, and I will um, let you know too that Jody Stumbo, the executive director for ERP is with us at the meeting. And um, so we can certainly call her in um, with any questions or comments you have. Um, your emergency residence project um, in a memo that I had provided to the uh, council um, explaining that they closed their shelter on May, or I'm sorry, March 22nd um, due to the, to the virus and um, the fact that they couldn't successfully implement the social distancing and the, and the health um, parameters needed um, at that point in time. And so um, they had exhausted the city funding for their shelter in February, and um, they decided to, at, at the point that they closed the shelter, um, to move individuals into hotel rooms. That's usually their overflow option when the shelter's full, um, but they use those rooms then to actually house the individuals. And so that's where they've been for the time being, and council acted on April 14th. Um, to move um, some dollars within the ERP contract from service coordination to emergency shelter to help kind of bridge that gap. Um, in the meantime, Jody was working on, on a larger request because she knew she was going to have difficulty getting to the end of June 30th if she was going to continue housing individuals in a hotel. And so um, she's put that request together. And um, the total amount of the request is $52,650. And of that amount, $22,600 is being asked of the city. Um, she worked through um, a budget um, with um, United Way, the county, and the city on uh, determining the amount and um, changing that unit of service cost from $28.75 per night to $143.84 um, per night. Um, so um, this would be so a, a funding source to consider uh, utilizing for this um, would still be local option sales tax. Um, however, um, through the uh, Human Services Capital Funding Program um, that uh, Council had put in place, uh, we utilize uh, an agreement with United Way to administer that program. and. Um, they had a second round of uh, requests because of dollars left over. And um, so the dollars that were left over totaled to be um, 121,500. And if the um, uh, United Way committee um, funds all of the requests that they got for the human services capital uh, funding program, the total amount of those projects is 90,500. So there's up to 
$31,000 um, remaining um, out of that balance. And so um, our, our um, recommendation is to um, approve ERP's request of 22,600 um, to help increase the bed capacity through June 30th and that the funding for this request would come from the balance of the Human Services Capital Funding Program. Happy to answer any questions. And we can bring Jody on as well. Questions for Sue, uh, for Deb, excuse me. This, yeah. this, this amount seems pretty reasonable. Uh, and we guess that there might be some federal funding as well for homelessness issues. Um, Deb, I'm just curious, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm just curious if you have any any additional updates on numbers of uh, the number of people the ERP is serving. Well, Jody's on the Jody's available if you want to ask her that. Hi, Jody. All right, um, Brian. We open up public input on this one, and uh, I see Jody appeared on the screen, so. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, thank you for considering our request. Deb, thank you for all your help with this. Um, I'm Jody Stumbo, representing the Emergency Residence Project. Um, so your question, Tim, was about um, numbers that we serve. We'll serve between, in the last few years, it's been about six to 700 um, individuals that we serve in a year. And of those individuals, just trying to give you an idea, about 28% of them are under the age of 17. So that means a large majority of that number um, is families that are experiencing homelessness. Have you seen any kind of uptick since the pandemic? Or has it just been a matter of being able to locate them in your facilities? Um, I think, I think it's, um, a, we've seen an uptick in families, um, honestly. Um, we've had quite a few families coming to us or, or single parents coming to us. Um, we have had the, we've been running consistently at our half capacity with the beds we were able to sustain. And, um, we were, we were having to turn away people um, for for a short period of time. So we really haven't seen any decline in requests for services. Um, and I think probably the, the change or the uptick is in the dynamics of who we're serving and we're seeing more families. So I have a question and I don't know if it's for Jody or if it's for Deb. I'm wondering if the other two funding agencies have already approved their amounts that we see in the, the council action form. They have not, Gloria. Thank you. Anything else you'd like to share, Jody, with the uh, council under public comment? Um, I would just like to thank all of you again for your consideration um, and for your support. Um, we really appreciate everything that the city, the county, and United Way do, not only for our organization and our clients, but for the rest of the human services. Um, as you guys were saying earlier, we, um, we do a really good job here in Ames of um, making sure that things are, are taken care of and those that need us most don't um, get swept under the rug. So. Thank you. Any further questions for Jody? Thanks for you do, Jody. I know it's a challenging job and you're helping serve people that uh, really need that help. So thank you. Mayor, Brian, I do have one other thing I wanted to add, because Tim, you brought up the federal funding that may be available for this. And, um, and Jody can maybe speak to the status of um, ESG funds that come down from the federal government and through Iowa Finance Authority, just waiting to hear on those. Jody, I don't know if you have an update. Um, no, we do not have an update yet. I'm hoping by the end of the week. Um, they have, I think it's like they're getting three to four million dollars and that is being distributed 
Um, big chunks of it will go to some of the bigger uh, metro areas such as Des Moines, Iowa City, um, Sioux City. And then we are part of the kind of the greater Iowa grouping. And the way they're going to divide that funding is by region. Um, so one thing that a lot of people don't know is that we actually serve five counties. Um, we serve the two regions area, which is our uh, two rivers region, sorry, Boone, Marshall, Story, Hardin, and Green. So the thought is right now the funds that we may have come down through that ESG, we will be distributing them over the five county area. It wouldn't just be funding for Story County. Thank you. Okay. Brian, is anybody else that has uh, indicated interest in talking about this topic? Mayor, there is not. Okay, we'll close public input. Council? Move alternative one to approve the request. Second. By Martin, second by Garten. Any further discussion? Everyone understand the motion? Those in favor say aye. 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 It has to be a resolution. Yeah, so money. Money. Roll call. <laughs> yep. All right. Thank you. Roll call, please. Woody Hansen. Aye. Fetcher. Aye. Horton. Aye. Dunk. Aye. Corrieri. Aye. Martin. Aye. Thanks, Amy. Keep me on a straight and narrow here. Okay. Uh, 35C, Commission on the Arts. Brian. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, the Commission on the Arts met earlier this month and recommended that the City Council um, allow arts agencies that had funding left in their current year annual grant contracts and spring special project grant contracts uh, to simply draw down those funds whether or not the program was um, actually put on as required in the contracts. Um, doing so would release about $48,850 to annual grant, uh, annual grant contractees and uh, $2,700 and change to spring special project grant recipients. Um, the commission noted that a number of the agencies uh, have already um, expended some of their funds in um, obtaining rehearsal space in preparing for those rehearsals and, and so forth. And so they felt that the best course of action would be to allow the agencies to receive the funding, whether or not they, they actually completed the performance. Um, like your um, asset council action form, you have other alternatives. Uh, uh, we could uh, reallocate the existing funding to other areas that could be completed within the contract year. Uh, we could carry funds over uh, or you could simply do nothing and if the agencies did not complete the terms of the contract they wouldn't be eligible to draw down the funds. But the staff recommendation is to follow CODA's recommendation to allow the funds to be drawn down. Senator Brian. Anybody wishing to address council on this topic, Brian? I do not see anyone with their hand raised. Okay. We'll close public input. I'll move alternative one. Second. All right, moved by Corey, second by Garten. Um, all right, so Amy, this is a roll call. Just do roll call. Go ahead. It is roll call. Sorry, sir. Betcher? Aye. Barton? Aye. Dunk? Aye. Corrieri? Aye. Barton? Aye. Hanson? Aye. Hey. Okay, in the outside funding requests, um, you're faced with similar questions. Um, in this request, 
or in this situation, we don't have uh, an outside group that um, uh, has given you a recommendation. Um, we have um, a handful of activities, primarily um, event related activities that are likely not gonna be able to be drawn down uh, this fiscal year. Um, the uh, staff recommendation is to, similarly to the asset request, um, allow the agencies to reallocate the funding to a different task and draw it down before the end of June. Uh, if funds remain, allow that funding to be carried over into next contract year um, and allow staff to make those calls about, about how, what are appropriate activities. Um, alternatively, uh, the council could um, uh, direct us to deal with these outside funding requests like we did with CODA and just simply pay out the funds whether the activity took place or not, uh, or again, do nothing. Questions for Brian? Brian, how much staff time would be involved in renegotiating with these agencies? I don't think it would be a considerable amount. Uh, it would it would take a little bit of back and forth with each agency to identify what they can do, what they have been doing, um, and, and figure out an appropriate alternative use if that's the direction that you want to go. I don't think it would take an inordinate amount of staff time to go through that. There are only, I think, four the four agencies that we would have to work with. Any further questions for Brian? Anyone wishing to uh, open public comment? Is there anyone, Brian, that wants to address council on this topic? I do not see anyone with their hand raised. Okay, we'll close public comment. Entertain motion. We'll turn, we'll turn it to one. Who's that, Rachel? Amber. Amber. And Tim, was that you? Second. Second. All right. All right. Roll call. Garten. Aye. Bent. Aye. Barry. Aye. Martin. Aye. Beatty Hansen. Aye. Fetcher. Aye. Thank you. All right. And then item thirty-five E. So this is in response to a request the city council received related to landscaping in the downtown area from Ames Main Street. Uh, Ames Main Street requests um, an additional uh, $21,922 and change um, be added to its, its current year allocation for landscaping uh, to complete a landscaping project. Um, we've outlined for you in the council action form um, sort of the history of the landscaping and beautification related um, contract items we've had um, in the current year and what we have for next year in the outside funding request contract. Um, the concern that staff has primarily is that this would this would be taking additional funds from the local option sales tax fund and um, um, we, we know that the current health situation is having a, a pretty detrimental impact on that fund. Um, so the recommendation of staff is to uh, not approve this request. Um, but and then Ames Main Street would be able to conduct beautification activities under the existing contract amount of seventy five hundred dollars. Um, if the city council desired, we could reallocate funding in next year's contract um, and increase the beautification amount um, by decreasing the amount that we would pay for other activities, uh, and then we could work to um, to upfront that money, basically pay it out of the current fiscal year um, or pay it earlier uh, if that was the desire of the council. So um, I'll stick around for any questions you might have. Since we're Brian on this one. Oh, 
about public comment? Is anyone that wants to address council on this one, Brian? I don't see anyone with their hand raised. Okay. Well, it's public input. Council? So Brian, um, let me, I just want to um, check on something here. So we think that there's probably $4,500 in this year's contract that has been already allocated for events that are not likely to occur because of the pandemic. Is that right? Yes, there's, there are um, uh, two events. Um, so if, yeah, I think I see where you're headed there. If you wanted to, you could re we could reallocate that funding to beautification um, or some other task, whatever the council desires there for the current year contract. Yeah, I was just trying to think um, in aggregate how much might be readily available for reallocation. Um, I mean, we've got some in this year's and the next year we've already got the 7,500 in and i don't know there may be other events that are not going to be occurring that would be savings in the future but it all relies on us um, discussing with them the reallocation of funds not allocating new funds but allowing a different use of the funds that we've already allocated and and we've already authorized that in the previous item right well, we we did it for um yes so yeah. that's yes you can do that yeah yes yeah. so um, i it's hard to justify beautification in a time of austerity um but i'd like to try um the in the almost 24 years i've been downtown it's been remarkable the impact that the flowers and landscaping have made um, and if we want to sort of be catalytic for encouraging our downtown when it reopens fully, um, I think that uh, our, our beautification efforts really make a difference. It's hard to quantify this, and, I, and I, I'm a numbers guy. I'm having difficulty quantifying it, but I, I live down here, and I'm telling you, it makes a huge difference, and I think it um, is a small amount of money, and I'm open to maybe uh, finding some other sources of money to do this, but um, this is going to have an impact all through the early fall. And um, I don't know, I think, I think it's part of what makes our downtown great. So I'll leave it at that. I, have, I was going to make a motion. Go ahead. I would move alternative one. Is there a second? That's second. Not, not to approve additional funds. Okay. Martin seconded. Discussion. I, I was just going to say, I agreed with that first half of Tim's statement where he said that, <laughs> that it was hard to justify spending additional funds on beautification. I mean, I I do I agree that they have an impact, but, but we are really going to need to tighten the belt and um, I think, you know, there's a lot of, I, you know, I, I'm not saying I, uh, I'm not asking anyone, but I think, you know, like there's a lot of aesthetics that can be done through volunteer work down there too, if they really want to make it beautiful. I mean, it can be done. It'll look nice enough to get us through this year. You know, that's my thing. I would just add that I agree with with Tim that this sort of work is really important and can make a huge difference down there. I just think that it it needs to be competing on a level playing field with our other requests along these lines. And I, I think now is the wrong time to sort of make an exception to that, um, given all the complexities that we're also looking at at this time. But I, I think that, you know, it's there's a lot of merit in the request. I just I think that the timing is the killer for me. Yeah. Okay. 
Those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion carried 5-1. And we, in our last motion then, we have already approved staff working with Main Street to reallocate funds that we have already um, budgeted for them. Right. Yes, so yeah. we will reallocate those funds to the best possible use we can come up with. If you would like us to reallocate them to a specific purpose, uh, it would be appropriate to give us direction. I think Main Street can decide what they they think is important. Yeah, and I, I would I would say that I wouldn't characterize the vote we just took as one saying that, that we oppose beautification, that they shouldn't bother asking for that. I, I think it can be in the spectrum with the, the funds that we've already authorized to be reused. Yeah, true. I'm yeah, I, my right, my objection was just that being additional. Right. Okay. I am thirty six, Steve. Budget amendment. Sure. As you know, for the past three or four months, the city staff has been working on a COVID response plan. We've done it with our, ourselves and our partners. And I think uh, David articulated the three goals of that plan. We reached a point in time now, I think it's, we need to move on and develop a COVID-19 financial recovery plan. And it's time for us, to, I think, to think not only about the physical safety of our citizens, but also the financial safety of our community and our city. So normally what I would have, we would be in May at this time, we'd be looking at our final amendments. It's right before we end the fiscal year, we give you one, less, uh, one last look at the budget, see how it's changed since we brought it to you in February. And normally this is a perfunctory type of action on your part, but it's very important that this year it's different. Actually these final amendments represent the first phase of two phases that I'm going to uh, coin the financial recovery plan. And in that plan, it's my goal to, I have two goals for you. First, to try to end this fiscal year with the same ending balances that we projected back in February. And for next fiscal year to do the same thing, to end the, at the end of the year of that fiscal year, end the, uh, with the same ending balances in the majority of our major funds uh, that we at, we certified in the budget. Now, again, that's pretty ambitious. Um, and what makes it so is our best estimates for this year. If I hope to end the year the same balance we said in most of the funds, we had a reduction of about $9 million in revenue. So to meet that goal of first phase for this year, we're going to have to work together to reduce our expenditures by $9 million. Now, fortunately, that, that deals with all funds, not just one fund. And with the good work of a dedicated staff, the ELT, the, my executive leadership team, plus their staff members, we have, and we will show you, our phase one of the plan, which is represented in these final amendments. In almost every fund, we've accomplished that. There's a few we haven't. You'll see it in the Ice Arena Fund, the Parking Fund, and, uh, and obviously the Hotel Motel Tax Fund. But in all the others, I think, Given the estimates we have today, we've met that goal. Now, I could have brought you the second phase and start asking my departments to make cuts for next fiscal year, which starts July 1st, but a lot can happen in the next couple of months. So I want to buy a little bit more time. Uh, we will develop the plan for future cuts, excuse me, for next fiscal year, and I'll probably bring that to you in August. The world will change a lot. We'll see if our estimates hold true. These are estimates for this year. We don't know how long the the community or the country is going to be locked down or how the people are going to react once we open up in terms of driving cars and spending money on on purchases all affecting our budget as you know through the uh, local option tax and road use tax so we'll have the second phase later and uh, we'll bring that to you but this is an important time for you to improve these look very closely at them i think we've we've all kind of uh, looked at all the departments uh, we made some cuts. We want to make sure you understand them. I think they can be well well supported. I don't think you're going to see any major decreases in levels of service. We have a few in there that I want to highlight. But I have Dwayne here and Nancy will go over that 
for you, uh, fund by fund, and I want you to ask any questions. Uh, we need your support on this. Um, there are gonna be some major changes for next year's budget. No matter how we try, I'm pretty confident we're not going to, or how quickly the, the economy opens up, I don't believe we're gonna be able to reach the revenue expectation we had in the budget. So we're gonna to have to have cuts next year. How much, we don't know. To get ahead of that, I've directed that uh, all departments are gonna cease any outside travel or training, either in-state or out-state, beginning this year, but also continuing next year so I can promote some savings. We'll be looking at other adjustments along the way too. And the one service level we do have built into this budget, I think, and it affects the, the budget itself financially, is we're anticipating not uh, sponsoring the municipal ban this year. It's not only the financial aspect of it, it's the, uh, I think we're gonna have trouble trying to uh, accomplish the appropriate social distancing with a, a crowd that's very susceptible to, to the virus. So you may or may not agree with that, but that's uh, one of the, the real levels of service we're, we're committing to not opening up or not uh, progressing with unless you tell us differently. Uh, the actual budget, uh, actual budget for next year assumes, or excuse me, the budget for this year assumes we're going to open up the the outdoor pool, excuse me, uh, starting in June 1st. That's yet to be determined. We're a little nervous about that. We may not do that. We'll, we'll talk to you more about that next year. But those numbers are in there based on us opening up the outdoor pool and maintaining the indoor pool. So other than that, I, I think I want to answer any questions you have. Make sure you you can support this first phase of our financial recovery plan in response to the COVID-19 emergency. So Dwayne and uh, Nancy are here. We can go through that if you'd like, or you can answer, que ask questions. You've seen the materials, but I think we want to highlight some of the, the cutbacks. Many were from operations, but a lot for, were also from capital improvements too. Dwayne and Nancy, you there? We're here. We're here. Um, can you lead us through this. Uh, the council wants us to go through it. I think it's laid out uh, pretty well here. If if we call your attention to page one, the summary sheet, which goes through and and provides a summary of each of the funds. And as Steve mentioned, uh, you know most of the major ones we're able to balance out. Now, obviously, there were some that that we aren't, and that's uh, laid out here. You know, I think uh, we have. Uh, obviously really good control over the expenses so that I think that's pretty solid that part of it but on the revenue uh, some of those things are a little bit unknown so um, you know we'll be continuing to monitor that as, as Steve mentioned that'd be part of the, the two to see how these things go uh, going forward and we'll have you know a couple months to do that um, would you like us to go through these have you had a chance to review them fund by fund I, I have a, just a general question. So I, I think that we run a, a very lean budget in general. And so when the task comes to cutting costs, I think this is a very difficult task to do. And um, I'm going to take a fairly deferential posture. The, the one thing that I really appreciate is that we're not looking at an across the board cut. Yeah. Um, I think I, I have very, very strong opinions on across the board cuts when it comes to this kind of situation. So I appreciate the department chairs and the thoughtfulness that went into this. And I don't, I don't know that it's helpful for council to go in line by line. Uh, that sounds like a really painful and not sure profitable exercise. But the, the question I do have, if you could help us think through, are there two or three of these line items that particularly stand out that impact the way in which we deliver services to the community that that we might not necessarily think about at first blush so well, there's there's I'll a lot nancy, that goes into those I'll let nancy go over those in, in duane but some are not large but like i said the 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 municipal ban is a popular function so right. that's going to affect a lot of people uh two important projects that i cut out remember we had a substantial amount of savings in the general fund and we identified a number of projects if you'll notice I cut out moving ahead with any consultants to develop concepts for a new indoor aquatic center or a new uh, station to relocation, fire station re relocation. It's not just the money which we had to cut out to reduce the general fund to get to the goal, my first goal, 
but also I just don't think that we need to move quickly right now. I don't believe if we put a bond issue between before the people right now in the next year that we'd have um, much success. I think the economy is going to have to turn around. They're going to have to feel comfortable about their own finances before uh, they'll want to compound the normal tax increase with a with a, uh, a general obligation bond debt. So it's not a large amount of money, but I want, I want you to see that in the general fund that we've taken that moving ahead by hiring consultants to get concepts developed for those two projects. But so I didn't what? cut out. I didn't cut out any money in support of our financial feasibility study for internet service, nor our climate action plan. Although I have to tell you, a lot of consultants have slowed down and and deal with them. They're they're not. It's not as easy to have access to them. So we have not moved ahead as quickly as we like to contract with those with those type of consultants. But we haven't cut those out. We tried not to cut out anything that was in in the goal in the task or the goals for the city council in the coming year we thought were high priorities uh nancy or Dwayne, are there any other big uh, capital improvements that we delayed or cut out that you could go over with so, them? steve if i could real quick so timing wise where does that place us with the pool so in terms of the life of the pool and access and things well we were going to have to rush in any event to have a pool fully constructed and opened in time to replace the action by the school district to tear down our municipal pool. So there will probably be a time, a vacant time, uh, a year or so, uh, when the, this community will be absent an indoor facility, a recreational indoor facility. And I think that already, even if we were able to go through and start looking at doing a design right. and construction, there's still gonna be at least, I, I think you're gonna have at least a year gap. And right. it's probably gonna be longer than that now between it's when they design. Divide. You have the design, but you also have a period of time you have to educate the public, convince them of the importance of it. And again, I just think it's going to be very difficult to pass bond issues. I may be wrong, but I think it'll be difficult and, and probably throughout the country to, to do that. So we'll, we'll move quickly, but I cut that out right away. I had to make some cuts in the general fund. Uh, the general fund was impacted mostly by the reduction in local options sales tax, which, you know, 60 percent of that goes to property tax relief. It was built into our budget this year. We had less revenue coming in for that, so we had to make it up by cutting items out of the general fund. Now, I haven't in this phase yet anticipated any money from the federal government. So those cuts we made may be able to be restored if there's any money that comes through from, from um, the CARES 4 Act they're talking about uh, that may come through the states and local government. This way, I was able to meet most of the most of the uh, the funds have will end the year as we as we projected uh, originally projected in February, which is a major accomplishment. I think I can assure you there are cities throughout the country that aren't able to do this, and we'll have even more trouble next year. Now, next year will be next was going to be more problematic. The hanging fruit we've picked already, so I might have to come with more drastic recommendations for you. Um, I, I don't think we're going to put a freeze on positions or certain positions we have to have to replenish that are already authorized. We may delay some of the new positions that I had built in for next year until we're sure that the economy is turned around. But I'll bring you those, as I said, in, in August. But to answer your question again, Nancy, are there some big um, cuts we made in either capital or operations you could share? I think that most of the savings that we identified the departments did a really good job of going through and um, a lot of the savings were from you know conferences that were canceled travel and training any salary savings that we had um you know the main program areas i think that were impacted were of course the ones that we've had to cancel like for parks and recreation so they had a lot of both lost revenue and lower expenses because of that um, for CIP, I think kind of the main ones that we that we um, took funding from are ones that are kind of ongoing programs like um, water system improvements, the city hall downtown project, of course, the city hall renovations, where it's kind of a money and money for a year, and then we carry it forward. And we knew that we had enough to get through this year, and maybe we just pushed a couple projects back into next year. I think Don is like looked at one of his projects and is delaying it into next year and then that's will be part of the phase two of this plan we'll be re-looking at uh rebalancing his cip out for future years i don't think that there were any big projects that we 
that we cut, we did um, money that we would have carried over for downtown and campus town facade programs. Um, we did take those out for this year, but they'll have another allocation available again beginning July 1st. Yeah, the neighborhood improvement grants, the facade okay. programs, both downtown and campus town. We had uh, we were done with the, the rounds, I think, for the rest of this year. So yeah. anyone that's over, uh, we put back into the fund rather than carry forward. Right. And as Nancy said, we'll have the same amount budgeted for next year. Start again. Okay. So. Council had any other questions for Steve and Nancy or Dwayne? That was a good summary. Thank you. I would agree with Tim that I think that we we have exceptional staff, you know, exceptional leadership team, done a tremendous job, and uh, to start going through and looking at line by line, I think that it's just important to know that the hardest one to, to swallow is the uh, municipal ban because it's so popular. But how do you how are you going to achieve social distancing out there in the Banshell Park and also at the Banshell itself? Yeah, six, six feet for 500 or 600 people is not going to be possible. And the band themselves are pretty close. So, again, even if the governor opens up these kind of uh, activities, you'll have to decide. We don't think it's a good idea uh, to do it for the next couple of months, the summer months. But I'm sure that might that will not be a popular decision by people who really advocate this. But it's a safe thing to do, I believe. So has there been any kind of conversation with uh – um the band the, the band at all on this yet or not uh, keith was on is keith still on there uh brian let me see i think, it's, I think it's really important that uh i'm here steve yeah keith any discussion with the band warning about the potential elimination of the season yeah well craig kaufman um who's our auditorium band show manager he has had conversation with mike limo who's the the band director uh, Mike would really like to, to start having conversation with band members, but we've told them to, to hold off right now. Um, and we've told them that this will, a final discussion would be on May 12th, and, um, and that's when a final decision would be made. So, so they're holding off at this time. Okay. So just on the band for a moment, because that is so popular, let's say that we got into – uh, late June and we got the all clear. Is there a way that we could do some kind of restoration of some funding uh, to allow them to have even a few concerts? Is, is it sort of an all or nothing? No, I believe we could, we could, um, we could find the money. Now, again, I'm assuming our estimates are right. If those estimates are wrong and we're $2 million off, we'll be in trouble. But I think it's uh, the amount of money that's, that we'll need for, for a small season or a shorter season, we could probably work out depending what they'll agree to. You know what I mean? When does band concerts normally start? Is that like in uh, June? Early June. It's just a it's just a really painful. Yeah. In terms of the uh, the sense of you know community healing and trying to do something which would uh, enhance people's lives after being cooped up for so long this is this is the hard one this is a, this is a bitter pill to swallow i understand what we're trying to accomplish yeah um over the year you know it's, it crosses two fiscal years but i think it's what is it keith thirty seven thousand two, which again yeah. isn't a, a big thing but we were cutting a lot of little things here to add up to those hundreds of thousands of dollars but it doesn't mean we couldn't restore it if you wanted to and some of some of the conversations we've had as well is is would there be an opportunity to do something um, virtually that you could still put it on channel twelve? Uh, individuals could be safe. It may be um, smaller groups of the of the band members. You know, so those are some, those are some things that uh, you know Craig and and I have had some conversation on. Uh, it may not be the same thing, but it would still be something you know that uh, uh, could get out for the public. Keith, did, did Dr. Gleamel have any thoughts in terms of the just how compressed they are out there in the band, under the band shell? I mean, I can't even see how they gave me six feet apart um, as a uh, band members. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the main things is it, it, it is very tight, and there's no way you'd be able to to do the six foot social distancing up there. 
Um, I'm not sure if Craig had that, that specific conversation um, with Dr. Glimo, um, but uh, but that is one of our concerns. Just think too, in terms of in advance discussing it with Dr. Glimo and explaining the reason why and and how much we regret having to do it if we if that's the council's decision. Yeah, and he understands that. Yeah. I should point out also the parking fund. That was one of the areas we were not able to cut enough cost to, to take care of the uh, impact of lost revenue. Uh, what page is that, uh, Nancy? Um, uh, I can't, I don't know. The parking fund is... I see page 16. 16. Uh, towards the end? Uh, yeah, page 16. Just want to show you um, we lost as you can see a lot of revenue uh, look at that two hundred and eighty nine thousand dollars in revenue and that's the impact obviously of nobody coming down to campus town or downtown every was everything was locked down now it's not that we cut the expenditure necessarily the way we had to balance it is we had hoped even at the 50 cents per hour that we were going to generate enough money to cover not only the operating costs, but transfer for the first time into a reserve account. If you remember that uh, last year, when we were at a dollar uh, an hour, we were thinking maybe 800,000 could be moved in there. Uh, when we went to 50 cents, we decreased that. And I think now you'll see if you go to the next page, the next page or when's the parking reserve, I don't have the actual amount, but we're only going to be able to uh, place or well, we're substantially less than we thought we were in building up that fund, the reserve fund. So the way we balanced it, we just moved less money into the reserve fund. Does that make sense to you all? The parking fund? Yep. Okay. We, and we have tried to make expense cuts. There's, less enforcement, less people um, uh, parking in those areas. So we were cutting back hours on our community resource officers. They're the ones who primarily write the tickets. So we tried to cut as much as we could. Any further questions for Steve or Dwayne? So I, I'm sure we're gonna approve these. Um, has there been some consideration of how we're going to communicate this to the public? I don't know if John, you want to make another video or I, mean, I think it's important that we find a good way of communicating this to the community. Well, there's a, yeah, I, that's a good point, Tim. I think there's also a good news here. We're not cutting staff. We're not cutting, we're, we're, we're not really cutting hardly any services. Yes. You could say that the ban is a service, but we're not cutting police, we're not cutting fire, we're not cutting our parks and recreation staff. Right. Um, I mean, it's been a, it's a monumental heft to what they're doing and it's a tribute to the leadership and what they've done to really keep us in great fiscal shape and kind of a, you know creative solutions. And um, just to show you, Keith has worked very hard. He's got some full time staff members. What he's doing is um, we hire a, a lot of people in the summer to cut grass, let's say, and we aren't gonna hire those people. We had to make expenditure cuts there, but he'll use some of his recreation full-time people to maybe help in cutting grass. So we're gonna be as efficient as possible. People are gonna be redeployed and asked to do things that are not normally, you know, not normally done uh, in their normal uh, activities or responsibilities. So I think we're working as hard as we can to be as efficient as possible and retain those people because in three months, it's all gonna open up and you're gonna wish we had those people when we start opening up the program. So. Um, Want to do everything we can to keep them. Okay. Uh, Brian, is there anyone that wants to offer any public input on this item? I do not see anyone with their hand raised. Okay. All right. And entertain a motion giving direction to staff on these items. Well, yeah, with, with the approval here, you're saying you need a hearing on, I think it's May 12th, is it not for the? Uh, May 26th is what it said on the, it said resolution setting date of public hearing for May 26th. I'm sorry, May 26th. Don't you want a motion though, just approving the proposed recommendation? It's, when you approve this, it's like you do when we do our budget. This is the, this, these are the numbers we're gonna show 
to the public that we're publicizing as the final amendments. So you don't want to change it later on. We're, this is what you're taking the public say, this is what the final budget's going to be like. So I move, I move that we approve the amendment and set the hearing date uh, as stated. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. John? Aye. Lori Aye. Martin? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Metcher? Aye. Martin? Aye. Okay, Steve and uh, all the department heads, Wayne, Nancy, Thank you. I don't think we can really appreciate how much work you put into this to make all these numbers work. But boy, it's uh, it's pretty amazing to see what you've done, and uh, hopefully we can, uh, you know, not have this huge cuts next year. But we'll we we're halfway there. Keep... We're only halfway there, but we'll work hard yeah. for next year too. All I know is I'm bragging up our staff and what an amazing job they're doing. I talk to other people, other mayors, and other. Uh, the media they're just doing an amazing amazing job and uh it's uh you take a lot of the burden off of us um and just as a i'll ask a question or during uh council comments okay moving on to item 37 uh he hearing on partial vacation and remote parking easement at 1901 north 4th street council do you have any questions of staff on this item Yeah, Kelly's here if you have any. Hearing none, this is a public hearing, so I declare the public hearing on partial vacation of remote parking easement at 901 North 4th Street to be open. Is there anyone who has indicated an interest to address council under public hearing, uh, public hearing on this item, Brian? Mayor, I don't see anyone with their hand raised. Okay, declare the public hearing on this item to be closed. Entertain a motion on resolution approving vacation of remote parking easement on lot one at 901 North 4th Street. So move. Oh. Approval. Second. Is that Gloria and who? Amber. Amber. Amber, thank you. Roll call. Corrieri. Aye. Martin. Aye. Lee Hansen. Aye. Betcher. Aye. Martin. Stain. Catholics. John. Aye. If I could just ask, I see that Dan Casciato and Corey Heiss are still here. Thanks for braving it with us until this moment, and um, I'm, I'm glad we did this. Okay. I have 38. Hearing a proposed zoning text amendment relating to the industrial use parking requirement. Any questions for staff on this item? Seeing none, declare the public hearing and proposed zoning text amendment relating to the industrial use parking requirement to be open. Is there anyone who is indicating an interest to address council on this topic, Brian? I do not see anyone with their hand raised, Mayor. Thank you. Declare the public hearing to be closed. Entertain motion on first passage of ordinance. Mayor, Mayor, I just want to give credit to Kelly. Many times city governments are criticized because they have very stringent laws that add to develop, developers' cost and demand changes in the law. Actually, this is initiated by Kelly, so to give him credit, he's coming in, and this is an example of us relieving the burden and hopefully the financial cost to developers. Mayor, right. move on first. That's your first. Uh, all right, that's your. Is there a second? Second. Mark Garten. Roll call. Martin. Hi. Katie Hansen. Aye. Aye. Betcher. Aye. Burton. Aye. Dunk. Aye. Corey Aye. Thank you. And item 39, any questions of staff on the boiler tube spray coating and related <laughs> supply for the power plant? Seeing none, declare public hearing on the boiler tube spray coating and related services and supply for power plant to be open. Brian, is there anyone who's indicating an interest in addressing council on the topic? No. Hearing none, declare the public hearing to be closed. Entertain a motion 
uh, on approving final plan specifications and awarding the contract to WearTech Incorporated of Jacksonville, Florida in amount not to exceed $350,000 for FY 2019-2020 and $200,000 for FY 2020-2021. So moved. So second. Who was first? Who moved? Me, Brownman. Brownman and Gloria. Gloria. Second it, thank you. Roll call. Petey Hansen. Aye. Fetcher. Aye. Burton. Aye. Hi. Aye. Martin. Hi. Okay, moving on to ordinances. Entertain a motion approving thir uh, on third reading and adoption of ordinance number 4409, changing the street name and speed limits for University Boulevard in the Bergeson annexation area. Move Move on on third. Second. Who's first? Amber. Amber and then Gloria. Thank you. Roll call. Fletcher? Aye. Martin? Aye. Young? Aye. Boyeri? Aye. Martin? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Thank you. I obtain a motion on third reading and adoption of ordinance number 4410, rezoning 207 South Teller Avenue from Agricultural A to Government Airport District S hyphen G A. Move on third. Second. Gloria and that brown one. Rachel. Rachel, thank you. Roll call. Barton. Aye. John. Aye. Gloria. Aye. Barton. Aye. Amy Hansen. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. And entertain motion on third reading and adoption of ordinance number 4411, approving zoning text amendment relating to high screen landscaping contained in section 29.403.3F of the municipal code. I'll move, move on third. Second. That's uh, Brownwin and Gloria. Roll call. Joan. Aye. Gloria. Aye. Martin. Aye. E. Hanson. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Burton. Aye. Thank you. Moving on, dispositions of communications of council. Uh, there are five items listed. The first one was addressed under item 35D. Second item was addressed under Ames Main Street Farmer's Market added to the agenda. Uh, three was also taken care of. Item four and five are emails relative to speed limit and pedestrian safety on Mortenson Road. Yeah, I think the final two should be referred to staff for a memo, a progress report. Move we refer those to staff for a memo. Second. Second. Okay, those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? Motion carried. All right, moving on to council comments. Uh, Rachel, I'll start with you tonight. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, our ex officio, Devin. This would have been his last meeting, and I want to thank him for a great year of serving the students and the people of Ames. Um, I'd also like to thank our city staff for um, adapting the Eco Fair to be virtual. I thought it was a really cool way to um, still have this event, and I really enjoyed the programming on KHOI and the virtual scavenger hunt this weekend. So, thank you. Thanks. Amber? Nothing. Rylan. Um, I took a phone call earlier from a constituent and I, I thought I'd pass it on just because I don't, yeah, it'd be a good opportunity to do it. It was someone who was just very concerned about the governor's reopening of anything on May 1st and she wanted the mayor to make a proclamation. I, and I said, I don't know if you ever took her call or not, but I told her I'd pass it on that she had that request, but that, you know, it's certainly not something I had the power to do. You know, I just wanted to, yeah, pass on her comment. So I thought it would be an okay time to do that. You want to, uh, you want to email me her uh, name? I've been playing phone tag, or playing, I called someone back last week and then I haven't had a chance to get back to her, so. Yeah, it was just today, I think she called, and I forget, her, I remember her first name. Okay. 
I don't remember her last name. I'm sorry. I can yeah. I can text you your phone number. Or something. That'd be great. That'd be good. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I just I told her I'd pass it on, so I wanted to do that. Um. But yeah, that's all I have. David. Nothing tonight. Jim. Uh, on a sad note, I've been watching the COVID nineteen website with great attention, watching this play out over Iowa. We had our first death in Story County. And so uh, I, I said, we sort of send our joint condolences to the family. We don't, I don't know who this is, but uh, uh, sad to have our first death here in Story County. That's all I have for tonight. Okay. Uh, I'd also like to thank Devin for his service. I think he's been a great advocate for the students and is, has been very thoughtful in contributing to our meetings and arranging for us to be meeting with the student government. Um, my husband and I had the opportunity to donate to the Food at First Parks and Rec food pantry donations. So uh, that was going on today and he said he thought that it was well attended and was very happy with the Parks and Rec staff's enthusiasm for the community um, generosity. And then finally, um, I've mentioned that I'm working on a lobbying effort with the National League of Cities and the ICMA and International Town and Gown Association to try and get Congress to allocate some additional funds for college towns who are likely to experience severe undercounts in the up or in this current 2020 census, which will impact federal funding for the next 10 years for these college towns. Yeah. And the letter that we have been working on has been finalized. I have just received an email about it, and I will forward it to all of you. It's something that can be signed on to if any of you are interested, but um, we have wide support across the nation for this since many of the college towns are not those that are uh, 500,000 population and above. And so we are in one of those gaps. So we're, we're guardedly optimistic that they may pay attention, uh, Congress may pay attention to this and uh, perhaps allocate some funds to college towns to do a recount after what we are likely to get this year with so many of our students gone. And that's, that's it for my update. Good. Well, once again, just want to thank staff for all their efforts and the teamwork that they're putting in to uh, you know, continue to run the city under extenuating circumstances. Um, I echo what Tim shared about you know, our condolences to the family who um, lost a loved one uh, today. Still can't believe how fortunate we are to be under, under 30 you know, uh, confirmed cases. I watch every day. I think we're over 600 tests that have been done. So our uh, test to uh, confirm cases still is very, you know, it's very low. And uh, I think it's, um, I, I uh, applaud council being cautious in terms of what being perceived by the community in terms of there are people that are still very concerned about opening up. And I mean, you're, you're seeing the same emails that we're, that I'm getting that, there's some that are thrilled and want to throw doors wide open. There's others that are really concerned. They want to, you know, not, not do anything whatsoever. And so, uh, but, uh, I do believe that our needs are going to become more and more evident in the months ahead. And once this, uh, um, spike, so to speak is over, uh, I just want to we'll, we'll be want to be very mindful of those who may be permanently unemployed, those who have who are food insecure. Um, I think that we're going to really need to be attentive to those needs, you know, in the community. And uh, thank you for what you're doing, Council, and for your uh, supporting ERP and and Asset and the other organizations. And uh, um, I, I can't think of a better place to be. <laughs> 
in the midst of this whole situation and uh and the positive nature that uh, the chamber is, is doing and leading in terms of you know being very proactive in terms of trying to support the businesses and uh, we're going to need to be doing that when we come out of this uh, i believe that we will be um, so with that i will entertain a motion to adjourn for this evening move to adjourn all right we are adjourned thank you everybody